I'd like to welcome you to the Coeur d'Alene School District 271 board meeting for December 3rd, 2018. Will the gentlemen please remove their hats and everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd just like to take a moment to go ahead and introduce the participants up front this evening so you know who's sitting up here. I'll start at my far right with our board clerk, Ms. Lynn Town, and then Dr. Stephen Cook, our superintendent. To my immediate left is Tom Hearn, our vice chair, Ms. Lisa May, board member, Ms. T Tambra Pickford, board member, and Ms. Jen Brumley, board member. My name is Casey Morser, and I'm the chair of the school board. Public comment on district-related items is scheduled near the start of this meeting. Please sign in on the sheet provided at the entrance door. Because of the diversity of issues, members of the board will not respond to public comment made during tonight's meeting. Instead, issues may be recorded and referred to the proper staff person for follow-up. Comments may also be submitted to the board in writing through our clerk. Thank you. Okay, is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Whoa, <laughs> split it up between them there, Miss Town. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries, Miss Town. Okay, we're going to start off with our board recognition here then. Dr. Cook, are you ready? Good evening. Kootenai Health has a history of providing ongoing support of the students and staff of Coeur d'Alene Public Schools. Recently led by Carlana Kugel, Jan Mosley, and Joanne Simon, Simon excuse me, Kootenai has pledged to provide a high level of support to help us prioritize critical student services in mental health and suicide prevention, improve immunization rates, and promote health services careers. So could we get them up here before I finish this? And a warm, warm welcoming applause, guys. Let's go. Come on up. With their ongoing financial support of the school district, Kootenai Health has helped strengthen our school health services department. With their assistance, we were able to train all school nurses in QPR suicide prevention this year. Our middle and high school nurses are now QPR trainers who recently trained all secondary teachers in QPR. And in particular, we wish to thank Carlana Kugel for leading QPR training for, just, <laughs> for over 100 community members this year. I just, it's like Google, but Google. <laughs> like Google, but Google. Kootenai Health also supports our efforts to expand Cope to Thrive, a program designed to help children, teens, and young adults deal with anxiety, stress, and depression. In another area of support, Kootenai Health encouraged the school district to work on improving school immunization rates. In response, we have changed our processes, and based on the initial data, we expect to see significant improvements in the next reporting cycle. Yay, go us. We are also working now with Kootenai Health to promote health services careers in our high schools, and we look forward to recruiting Kootenai Health professionals to mentor students through our new Coeur d'Alene Connects program. Tonight, in recognition of this ongoing support and collaboration, our Board of Trustees would like to award Kootenai Health with the Shining Star Award, so thank you all. as well all right so you're standing close to me do you want to, you get the mic so you can take just a minute to speak 
wasn't planning on that, but I will say that um, it has been a long and very special relationship between the school district and Kootenai Health. I think it's, um, boy, probably as old as 20 or more years, and we believe that together we can really improve the health of our community. Really appreciate our school nurses. I see Nicole out there and um, board and others that help. So I think Kootenai Health has had a long-standing commitment to improving the health of this community. And we do believe that healthy families that often starts with um, healthy schools um, is really at the very foundation. And uh, as Jan mentioned, this has been a long-standing relationship that we've had with the school district. And we are just very pleased and honored to be able to provide that support. And we also are very proud of Carlana. Uh, she really has been the person who has spearheaded um, much of this work, and uh, we wouldn't be here today without her efforts. So we're very proud of her. Thank you. <laughs> you, have a word? you have her middle yeah. name is Pash. I don't really know that I have any words, but it's been great working with. I've worked with lots of the school nurses and all the schools. I've done lots of QPR trainings, and numerous community members. It's been a great honor to be part of that, and really just spread the message that. Suicide prevention is really everybody's business, and we all have a role to play in that. And so it's exciting to see that that kind of has kind of spread and the contagion has kind of happening throughout the community, that people really are want to be aware and they want to know what to do and how to act and how to respond. So that's a really great thing. So hopefully we can make a difference in Coeur d'Alene. And I would just add one thing. Uh, as a member of the school district, I would like to say that one of the most important factors in school uh, health and wellness is great partnerships. So thank you for your collaborative approach, and we'll look, look to continue this relationship for the next 20 years. So let's give them one more round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you, guys, thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And that's it for board recognitions. And I'm going to follow up on the great partnerships that we have in this community and I just wanted to um, thank two of those partnerships that we have with Coeur d'Alene Education, um, CEP Coeur d'Alene Education Partnership and our um, Panhandle Kiwanis who help us recognize um, every month our Teachers of the Month for our Invest, Inspire and Innovate Award. So we're so grateful to partner up with um, both of those to honor our teacher, our first teacher of the month for November is Sonia Joy, and she is a Title I teacher at Atlas Elementary. And there she is. And then our next teacher of the month, um, this one is for October. I think it's for November, but maybe it is for October. Um, Kara Shanholtz, she's a sixth grade teacher at Woodland Middle School. Um, that was fun expression on her face when we came in on Friday she was shocked there was like a whole trail of us and then it was cute her students lined up and high-fived her um, after we did the ward and she was just grateful to not be wearing a hat that day as it was hat day um, so anyways um, and our last teacher of the month for November was Jessica Gaynor and she is an English teacher at Venture High School so we are so grateful um, to them and for all of our teachers that we have in our school district. So let's give them all a round of applause. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pickford. And congratulations, to, congratulations to those staff members. I'll go ahead and start our high school student body reports. Is Coeur d'Alene High School here tonight? We're good. Okay. Um, my name is Addie Smart. I'm the ASB president at Cordine High School, and this is JC Brockoff, uh, one of my ASB officers. We are really excited because our construction is wrapping up at our school, and our entrance is almost done. Um, we invite you guys to join us. We have our Viking Court grand opening um, on Friday. The girls' game is at five, and the boys' game is at seven. And we're really excited to share our gym with the community because it's been a really long process. Um, Basketball, wrestling, and track are all in full swing. Track is doing inside workouts, and basketball and wrestling are getting settled into the new gym and the new wrestling room. And we want to congratulate 
Our drama team on another state championship title. They've won seven out of the past eight years. So we are very, very proud of our drama department at Coeur d'Alene High School. Um, also, this week we have a scholastics meeting today. So we have a lot of bright students who are there competing. Um, we have a blood drive that's going on on Thursday and Friday that our DECA program is putting on. Um, we're also excited about that and being able to help people. Um, DECA regionals is on Monday, so we are also going to have the DECA program competing in that. And our seniors are busy at work. Their senior papers are due this week. So we are all excited as the class of 2019 to be kind of doing the last things as this as we get closer to graduation. So thank you for your time and we look forward to seeing you next month. Okay, thank you. Is uh, Venture High School Hi, my name is Rachel Hughes, and I'm here today to represent Venture High School. I'd like to thank each of you for providing me this opportunity to come forth and speak tonight and just share with you all the current events at my school. To start things off, I'd like to touch on our holiday dinner. Our holiday dinner occurred on November 9th, and we served over 140 people. Our school was featured on KHQ News that evening, where they, were, um, they went over the behind the scenes of just everything that goes down in our holiday festivities. This last month, our culinary arts program held a pumpkin roll fundraiser, which was a total success. Nine of our students were directly involved in the fundraiser, and a grand total of 52 rolls were sold, raising a total of $884. The money raised during our fundraiser will be distributed as follows. 100 to the FW, or VFW, 200 to the Community Action Partnership, and the remainder of all money earned will go to the Taz Cafe Fund for next year's project and for a spring field trip to tour other college options. Over 20 new students will be joining us this Tuesday for the start of the new trimester. And this last week, to mark the end of our first trimester, our seniors presented their senior projects, with most earning very high scores. Personally, I found the entire project to be very rewarding, and I believe it has helped set me up for my future, and I'm proud to say I was able to score 100% on this assignment. That's about all we have for this week, and I'd like to thank you all for your time this evening, and I look forward to joining you again next month. Thank you for being here. K-Tech, anyone from K-Tech tonight? Good evening. Hi, my name is Brianna Robinson. Um, I'm in the health professions at K-Tech, which is Kootenai Technical Education Campus. Um, over there, we have a two-year program. Um, for health professions, we have a junior and a senior class. Um, it's a two year long, like I said, we have two sessions, AM and PM. Um, we have 25 kids in each class, which equals to about 100 health profession students that we're gonna get out into our community. Um, hopefully everybody getting their CNA certification. Currently, the health professions program is at maximum occupancy, um, and we do have a waiting list. During the junior year, it's mainly academics, job shadowing. Um, we get CPR and first aid certified. Um, and then we just learn our basic skills like vital signs, how to take a height, weight, and things like that. Um, senior year, which is, I'm a senior right now for it, um, it's mainly skill-based and in the clinical setting. Um, we get to go to Kootenai Health, um, job shadow, some CNAs and RNs there. Excuse me. Um, we learn 26 skills total, so bed making, um, bed baths, things like that, how to ambulate a patient. Um, we have to maintain an 80% throughout our senior year there um we will graduate with a semester or yeah one semester of college med term which is medical terminology we will get our cna certification and we'll all be certified nursing assistants and we will get our assistance with medication certification um we do have a dress code as well we all have to be in scrubs um, from start to end of our day and then just as professional as possible so. Hey, thank you. And finally, Lake City High School. Good evening, esteemed board chair, honorable trustees, 
Superintendent Cook and District Administration. My name is Claire Mitchell and I am the ASB Treasurer at Lake City High School. Also with me tonight are ASB President Amani Pereira, ASB Vice President Emma Bull, and ASB Secretary Chloe Teets. Our focus during the holiday season has been on community service and we've been busy at Lake City. Our Jingle Books Drive is going strong and will be wrapping up next week. In addition, our FCCLA program ran our annual holiday food drive before Thanksgiving and collected hundreds of pounds of food for our food banks. We have also partnered with Union Gospel Mission again this year to provide Christmas gifts for the women and children sheltered there. And we're also collecting gifts for Toys for Tots during the month of December. In activities news, we're very proud to report that we had several students place this weekend at State Drama. Cheyenne Miller placed first in the solo audition category. Aubrey Bernard placed second in solo audition and Noah Cole placed third in solo audition. Winter sports are beginning with our wrestling and women's basketball teams already off to a strong start and our Stuco is finalizing preparations for Fight for the Fish next month. We had our annual Spike and Stuff boys volleyball tournament last month as well as our regional fall mixer dance, both of which were very successful and a lot of fun. We also had our academic lettering ceremony last month during which we had 55 first year pin recipients 23 first-year letter recipients, and 57 second-year academic bar recipients. National Honor Society also inducted 28 first-year members and 10 second-year members. We want to extend our gratitude to our college and career advisor, Ms. Delgizi, for being our keynote speaker. Her speech was inspirational and everyone commented about how moved they were. Thank you so much for your con constant support of our students. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come speak with you this evening, and we'll see you again next month after break. Okay, thank you all for joining us tonight. All right, up next is our Coeur d'Alene Education Association report. Good evening, Mr. Twitchell. All righty, thank you very much. Uh, board Chair Morris Rowe, board members, uh, Superintendent Cook, district officials and guests, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I don't know if any of you go out Black Friday shopping. I don't, I used to, but I'm getting too old for that fight. Um, but the day after I went out because we need a new TV and went there and the, where I was shopping at, I don't want to give any publicity or free advertising, but where I was shopping at, they had a great deal on a TV, but it said the volume buttons were broke. And I looked at it and just thought, well, shoot, I can't turn that down. I can't turn that down. All righty. So anyways, <laughs> typical response every time. All right, I will let you know that uh, you'll probably be happy to hear this month I am not gonna be going a lot about how high school should start later, although it should. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely dropping that for right, uh, you know, it'll come back later. So, uh, for the past month or so though, I uh, have been talking quite a bit to membership of the CEA uh, and just employees in general in the district and community members about the levy, which is a big topic right now. And so this message that I bring to you tonight is from the CEA. I can tell you that right now, there are absolutely, and this probably isn't a surprise, but there's unanimous support for putting raises in the levy. And that goes for all the employees, because uh, everybody is overworked and underpaid. We believe that uh, what you're proposing is right for the schools, for education, for the community, for educators, and for the students. Ultimately, it will benefit the students. We have needs in this district. We have safety and security issues that need to be fully addressed. We have mental health needs in this community and at schools that must be fully addressed. And the levy starts to address them. We have a need to retain employees. Employees that make a connection with the students want to be able to stick around, but often because of finances may not be able to. Teachers that have buy-in, educators, all employees, classified employees that have buy-in to the school community, make the school that much stronger, and make the education for the students that much better. The recent ra raises in Washington have made a lot of heads turn. That's no surprise. I know plenty of employees that are dusting off their resumes uh, or even looking at applying to go back to school for something else entirely. The survey that was put out shows strong support for raising that amount. I will tell you that 
amongst the membership. There was some disappointment, though, that at no point in the levy did was there even the option of saying, would you support keeping the same tax rate? Would you support raising the tax rate? That wasn't even an option on there. And so I heard quite a bit about that. One thing that I also heard quite a bit about was we need to let the voters decide. For the past several levies, the kind of rally cry of the district was the tax rate is staying the same. The tax rate is staying the same. It's not being raised. It's not being raised. And I say we need to keep it that way. We need to give the voters the chance to fully support education in our community. We want to be competitive with Spokane. We know that we can't fully do it with that. We know that the state of Idaho is not going to do it. And with the recent elections, we assume the status quo is probably going to stay the same as it is. We do not want to become the training grounds for the Pacific Northwest. I believe Coeur d'Alene, if we do the right thing, it can be different, especially here in Coeur d'Alene. We can have our employees stick around and stay around for the students. Our levy rate is well below the state average, and we need to give the voters a chance on that. I mean, with what we're doing, it's not even giving them a chance. Employees across the district, that includes administrators, certified, classified, everybody, there's too much on the plate. Feel like in Idaho, we have our paper plate, and it's not, not even the nice Dixie paper plate either that you get. It's the cheap, crappy store brand where if you even sneeze on it, you know, it starts falling apart. But that's what we get for our meal, and it just keeps getting loaded up and loaded up on. Stuff's starting to fall off, and eventually it's just going to all collapse. We need to have a good Dixie plate. My mama always told me not to half-ass too, too many things. It's better to full-ass them. No matter what we do, there will always be a small group out there that will say no to about whatever we do as a school district, no matter what. Um, and, and they tend to be vocal. I believe 100% though that they truly don't know all the amazing things that we do in this district. I believe that they're not fully educated on what we do and how hard it is and how much work and effort we put into it and how even though we, we are on the budget we are, but still we are pulled thin. We need more. As is with how the levy is being supported, membership is mixed. This is for the students. We need to do this so we can have consistency in the schools. I remember back when I was in grade school, I had an older brother. And I always remember, you know, if he had a great teacher, you know, occasionally a not so great teacher, it's like, okay, well, I'm looking forward to that teacher. Or heck, even sometimes when I was in junior high, you'd hear about the teachers in high school. And it's like, oh man, I can't wait to get up there and have that teacher. We have to have that, that continuity, that, that ability for people to have something to look forward to. And again, building that community at the school. In closing, I'll ask how many more employees, how many more highly qualified employees do we need to lose before the decision is made to fully fix the problem and not just put a small band-aid on it? How big does the red flag have to be? We can do better. We can do more. We have to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Twitchell. We've got no one signed up, no board members signed up for comments. Is that correct? Okay. So it's time for our public comment. And before we get going here, I'd just like to remind the public, while this is a meeting of the Board of Trustees that takes place in public, it is not a meeting with the public. It is a meeting of the Board to conduct district business. The Board does allow some limited public comment on district-related items. Those wishing to address the Board during the public comment period are limited to one comment not to exceed three minutes. If you have additional comments you, you would like to present to the Board, you may provide those comments in writing to our Clerk of the Board, Ms. Lynn Town. She will ensure that we receive this additional commentary. Please keep in mind that board members will not respond to public comment. If I determine that an individual statement is too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, or repetitive, I may terminate that speaker's privilege to address the board. We've got quite a few signed up here. A uh, couple things, if you haven't been with us before, just ask when you get over to the podium that the uh, light is on there, the mic, please, if you'll just verify that. And then I'll keep time for you, and I'll try to give you some notice once we've 
we've gotten around that three minute mark and just ask you to to uh, wrap stuff up so thank you very much first up uh, Ralph Gino Rio am I close Genorio okay <laughs> So the green light has to be on. Well, it sounds like it's on. First of all, it's my honor to speak to all of you uh, board members and members of the public. Uh, I know that educators in a district this large and this diverse do nothing less than save lives by providing hope to the hopeless and, ne and uh, help to the needy. I'm speaking in old-fashioned language today, a language of memory. The Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset once said that you are yourself plus your circumstances. Now, what that means to my proposal, which is to return Western civilization to the high school curriculum, is that you are your personality, but you are also the culture in which you swim. If you had two identical twins separated at birth, raised in different cultures around the world, they'd be different people. We need to understand our culture, and students most of all need to understand where the United States comes from, where the American Republic comes from, and that is from a discrete narrative, a specific story of Western civilization that begins in ancient Greece and extends to the present day. Right now, the schools do a wonderful job of providing diverse offerings in world history and offering Western civilization at middle school as well as high school level. The problem with this is that Western Civ is complicated. And the development of a typical middle school student is only going to capture the superficialities of it. We are a society that's shaking apart because we have forgotten what unifies us. Western civilization unifies us. One of the primary duties of public education is to acculturate the next generation. We've stopped doing that in the name of some notion of political correctness and equivalency, we have replaced Western Civ with world history. And we've replaced a discrete and significant narrative story with a beginning, middle, and end with a bunch of case studies. I once had a student who went uh, to football practice one day and got a concussion. And he lost his entire life before that day. I have a grandmother who had Alzheimer's disease. Memory is what keeps us ourselves from moment to moment. With all due respect, I recommend that this district begin to teach again in a significant way to high school students the memory of who we are as a culture. The American Republic comes from European civilization. The high schools do teach that. But at the high school level, there is not, to my knowledge, a significant requirement to learn ancient history and medieval history. That would be like understanding the Star Wars movie if it started where everyone arrived on the Death Star. It's not quite enough, in my opinion. So with sincere respect, I recommend to my professional colleagues and to members of the community and the board that you consider the old-fashioned notion of replacing world history with a narrative of Western civilization. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for the comments you submitted to us earlier today. Okay, next up, uh, Michael Emery. Good evening, Mr. Emery. Well, my name's Michael Emery. Uh, I am a taxpayer in this city. I am a parent of two boys, both in school, and I am an employee of District 271, 21 years here in this district, and 25 in education overall. So I think this is the second time I've been up to speak to a board like this. Uh, it's sort of a cool thing, and I want to tell you guys thank you for taking the lead in addressing the needs of our district and supporting education for the students in our city. Uh, a couple things I really just wanted to touch on. First, uh, with the levy, uh, it is much appreciated that you guys are taking that, um, taking the initiative to increase the levy amounts as the costs 
and of support and programs that we have in our district, they don't go down. They're, it's always an upward uh, rise in the costs and stuff. Um, as one of the people that are in the buildings that are working with these kids, I can tell you all the time that the programs that we do, they cost money. And to do them well, it costs more money. Um, the, the quality of the employees that we have, um, we have some of the best, I think, that in the area that I have worked with. But I also know that in Spokane, and this is a huge issue, attracting and retaining quality employees is one of the priorities in this district. That That is a very real concern of a lot of people in our building and buildings of people I've talked to. Just for myself, I mean, I looked at that salary thing that they had over there, and I could make 30 grand more a year by going over to Spokane or East Valley or any of those places like that. Uh, the commute sort of a turnoff and stuff, but in the 10 years that I have left, we're talking a quarter of a million dollars. That's a huge difference in salary. Um, so I, to sort of tell you what Bruce was saying, that should be one of the key things that we think about with this levy. And with the levy, um, just reading the articles in the paper, the survey that came out, I would ask you to really, before it's finalized, reassess the costs of the programs and the services that we provide in this district, especially at an elementary level. I don't know if we have any elementary teachers that are here that would be willing to speak to that, but that's our foundation for the kids going into middle and secondary levels. And if we try to use a Band-Aid approach, like I know there's a, po a political expedience thing, you know, like a political cost to putting it out there. And we have a very vocal minority of taxpayers. And with these levy, the survey results, you can see that we're looking at 50%, more than 50% are in support of increasing it. They want it to do better. They're willing to pay for it. So I would ask, reassess what the actual costs are, if you want to do this adequately, or do we want to be exceptional? Because there's a price tag involved with that, with everything. And I think we do have the support. Parents that I speak to in the community, they're willing to support programs, especially with our levy rates, 231 per thousand dollars assessed. Compare that to Boise, compare that to Lakeland, and see, our taxpayers, we're getting a bargain on this. The cost that we pay in taxes for the services that we provide. And the people that make these comments in here that I've read, they, they must have never been in the schools because what they're talking about, I don't know those people or those things that they're talking about. And I think you could say, oh, you know, it's not going to cost you anything. And they would still say, no, I don't want to pay any more money. <laughs> and that's, you know, I, I just think that's how it is. So. In summary, what I would, I would just really encourage, reassess, We're not, it's not a big hurry to get this out. Ask the people in the district, the people that are working with these kids, what, are, what do you guys need? What are your priorities? What would make your programs exceptional as opposed to adequate? And then go back and revisit that. I mean, the four million is great. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think that's the best. I mean, I've been through several boards here, many superintendents. And I, you guys are doing a knockdown job and stuff. But I think this is a time now where you have an opportunity to make a difference that'll be way beyond your guys' tenure here as a board. Um, so just please, uh, as you go to do this, to reassess, take a look at what the costs are, and then maybe come back and present to the public, hey, you guys get into the schools or have the press or media get into the schools and say, these are the issues. Would you be willing to, to fund it at this level? Because I think you would be surprised. There's probably quite a large amount of support for that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emery. Next up, Janelle Cavanaugh. Good evening. Um, my name is Janelle Cavanaugh. I am a former uh, special education para in District 271. And I have a letter here this evening um, from a parent. Uh, she had to work tonight, so she asked if I could read uh, her letter for her. Uh, Board Chair Morris Rowe, trustees, uh, Superintendent Dr. Cook, and Ms. Town, thank you for your time. We have to bring up the letters here. They're getting a little small. Uh, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I write to you today as a concerned parent of a child 
in the Coeur d'Alene School District. My son Barrett has attended the Coeur d'Alene <coughs> School District since preschool and is currently flourishing in first grade at Bora Elementary. Barrett is a bright, friendly, and charming little boy with cerebral palsy. He loves to read books, learn new things, socialize with his peers, and make new friends. His success comes in part from the teachers and staff of the Coeur d'Alene schools he has attended. As we progress further into his education career, educational career, I find myself looking ahead at where Coeur d'Alene School District is heading. In the last year alone, Barrett has seen struggles with staffing for paraprofessionals. In the span between kindergarten and where we are now in the first grade of his in the first grade Barrett has taken care has been taken care of by at least seven different paraprofessionals while that number wouldn't be surprising over the course of several years that is a bit alarming in terms of a year and a half three of his past paraprofessionals have left the Coeur d'Alene school district for good these three in particular had great deal of experience and their loss was for a loss of all kids they had taught and aided Barrett's kindergarten teacher also has left the district to work over in Washington, something she mentioned to his father and I in the middle of the last school year. A family friend who is currently attending University of Idaho for her degree in special education also plans not to work in the Coeur d'Alene School District and move to other locations that offer more in terms of pay and benefits. These two individuals are creative, passionate, and enthusiastic teachers. I am distressed that my son's school district will be missing out on such bright educators. There are many things that I have to advocate for my son, and his education is one of the most vital areas I advocate within. I write this letter in hopes to bring awareness to the needs of special education students and all students in our district. The losses of educators and staff are starting to be felt across all levels, both within special education and general education. These losses are unsustainable and will continue to negatively affect our students. We must find a way to notably increase our wages for our teachers, staff, paraprofessionals, and others responsible for educating the future of Coeur d'Alene. I thank you for your time and consideration. With respect and gratitude for your service, service Janae Limtiaco. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, Scott Travers. I have to raise this a little bit, you know. Um, uh, good evening, uh, Board Chair Morris Rowe and trustees and Dr. Cook and Miss Town. Uh, and thank you guys for being here. Um, I feel like we really don't understand how much time you put in and, and we appreciate that immensely. So last week, I uh, knew I was going to come in here and, and say a couple of things and I kind of thought, well, you know, I'm going to make a little list and, and I've really got it nailed and I know what I'm going to say and this is really good. And uh, that changed when I went to the grocery store on Saturday and I ran into a former employee of the district who currently works for Central Valley and we had a really nice chat. And she was talking about how much she loved Central Valley and, and how good her kids were, and it was fantastic. And right before the conversation wrapped up, she said, and I wrote this down, I should have done this years ago. You should come to Central Valley too, Scott. And I thought, whoa, you know, I've never really, but you know, I've always thought, okay, well, maybe I'll go over to Washington, and we've thought that before. But I never really put a lot of stock into it. And so I went home, and I thought about what she had said. And I changed what I was going to say to you. And I think, number one, I, I know we don't live in Washington. I get it. I know that Idaho does not fund education like Washington does. And we can't do anything about that. I know it's not fair that we have to compete with Spokane. But the truth is, we do have to compete with Spokane. And I'm sorry to say that. Um, I have a friend who vets police candidates for the Spokane Police Department. And he is here all the time. And he says the Coeur d'Alene Police Department and the Kootenai County Sheriff's Department, they train the Spokane officers. And it's true, they're thankful for it. <clears throat> I really hope that School District 271 does not become the training ground for Spokane area 
teachers. Um, I recently became a grandfather, like five weeks ago. And it is, by the way, exceedingly cool. And I have, I have lots of pictures. Um, at any rate, I was, I was thinking about the little peanut. And what I really do not want for her is that when she gets up into the school age, because she lives out in Hayden, um, I do not want her to have a revolving door of first and second year teachers uh, who are just biding their time until Spokane calls. I really don't. And so I guess what it comes down to is you folks here have the unenviable job of making sure that we don't become the training ground for Spokane teachers. So thank you. Okay, next up, Derek Colas. I'm not quite as tall as Scott. Um, it's fun to be up here again, I guess. Thank you all for letting me speak. Um, you've done an amazing thing in the administration in proposing an increase of $4 million to the levy. Um, we have an incredible cadre of dedicated teachers in this community and, and in, our, in our school district. And the more we talk about how, how nice it looks over in Washington, the, the more we risk losing them. But that is the reality. Um, I want to commend you on your courage. Uh, I have been working on levy campaigns now for about six years or eight years um, as a CEA president and vice president. And this is the, the best proposal that I've seen. I have been preaching for years that we should ask for what we need. That is what we try to teach our students, to advocate for themselves. Ask for what you need. I went to the, I don't get enough meetings, so I went to the funding formula meeting this summer. And you don't have the ability, as Scott said, to solve every problem. We missed that opportunity in November. Um, but the funding formula expert talked about school districts and states that, and Idaho is one of them. We continue to use a putter off the tee, was the analogy that he used in trying to fund public education. That stuck with me. Thank you for pulling out your six iron. It's still a par five hole, but we're going to make more progress. Thank you for the work that you do. It is uh, a noble and thankless many times job, and uh, I appreciate it. I hope that you will consider what you're, what you're hearing here tonight from your teachers and from your community and uh, dig a little deeper into the, into the golf bag. Thank you. Okay, next up, Melissa McKenna. You brought props. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you so much for letting us come and share with you our feelings about the levy. And um, I I'm a teacher in the school district, Melissa McKenna, and I have been teaching for 19 years, 20 years in the district. I also grew up here and went to school here, and so I've been here my whole life. Um, it's weird to think about the possibility of someday moving, um, but unfortunately those thoughts have crossed my mind. Um, I currently not only am a full-time teacher, I'm on every leadership Thing that I can sign up for. I have a difficulty in saying no. I'm on the negotiations team. I'm a co-lead for our district's crisis team dealing and helping with people with mental health issues and crisis that help or happen throughout the district. Um, I'm a science lead teacher at my building. Like I, I have all these things I can't say no to. Unfortunately, 
they all really don't pay. And so at some point I have to decide, am I going to be a professional who loves my job and loves kids and loves people and love all the staff I work with and keep doing what I'm doing? And I am, by the way, I have had so many trainings and so many things. I have so much knowledge to help that I'm actually at a point where I'm kind of good at what I do, and I'm not saying that in a bragging way. I just have had so much training and so much experience that I can come in to any school that has had a crisis situation, and I can lead the administrators and help them through a very difficult situation. And not that I want to be that person, but for whatever reason, that has been something I've done in our district for 15 years um, and have a passion to help people in those moments that are very hard. Um, I get paid nothing to do those things. I am a person who comes in on the weekends to do my plans and anything I have to do when I'm gone for those events, sometimes two and three days at a time. And I'm having to do my sub plans on top of all the extra work that it creates um, for my kids. And, and so that's just one area of things. The negotiations team preparing and researching to help out my fellow staff members to help negotiate for them. Um, all of which, um, I'm, I'm not even sure what that pays. I, it's like maybe two cents um, here and there. But I do it because I'm passionate for helping people. Um, I have a four-year-old who had to come with me tonight because I have to choose. Am I going to be passionate for my profession? Am I going to be a mom? Um, and so unfortunately now I'm at the point in my life where I love what I do and I'm I'm finally really trained and really helpful part of our community, but I have to choose to be a mom or be that person. And without the pay to help even provide some awesome things for my kid, like I have to weigh out, what am I going to do? And so now we're at a point where you're going to see a lot of staff members like myself who are gonna start having to make a decision because they have to be, they can't every day wonder Am I going to be the person who is really good at my job and my family suffers? Or am I gonna be a good mom and then I feel like my kids at school suffer because those are my kids. Um, and so I ask you guys to look at the levy a little bit more. And um, like all everybody has said tonight, I know that your hands are tied. The state has tied a lot of what we're doing. And I'm so grateful that you're considering what you're considering to put in the levy. But think again about maybe even raising that, um, putting it out to the staff and asking them what they really feel like the money um, could go towards. Because I've been in the district as long as I have, programs come and go. We're always looking for a new program. We're looking for things to help kids and that's what makes us really great. But it's not the programs, it's the people. You can do anything if you have relationships with your kids and you're a good educator. You give me anything and I can teach that to kids. I make a connection with kids. I make a connection with staff. And so it is vital moving forward that we start keeping people, keeping good people. And that's what helps kids. And I know one of the considerations on the levy is to um, provide more money for mental health services. Um, but having quality people is what you do to give people help with mental health, those connections with people. So I just ask, um, again, to look at the levy and um, consider even raising the amount. Um, can you just say hi to everybody? Hi. Yes. What's your name? Jackson. How old are you? Four. Okay. Say have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, last up, Richard Rowland. Good evening. They didn't get two, two in your head. I think there's just some more. Uh, there was a few that crossed off. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Didn't realize I was that far up on the list. But, uh, so, you know, as Mark Twain said, uh, I'd have made it shorter uh, if I had the time, but <laughs> I'll try and keep it under three minutes. I had uh, a couple of items I wanted to comment on, but I'm only allowed one comment, so I'll try and uh, make them go together. I was here a couple of years ago talking to you about uh, transportation safety issues in the school district and uh, decided to come back and talk about transportation again. I was very concerned to hear a couple of weeks ago that the uh, Lakes Highway District 
uh, has put a bit of a stumbling block into the development of the uh, elementary school out on Prairie Avenue. Uh, I have not been able to get a hold of the traffic studies that have been done so far and uh, I'm not familiar with the details of what their concern is, but I do know that both the Kootenai Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Lake School District, uh, as well as this uh, school board uh, are all responsible for assuring that that building gets built, that schools put in place, and that uh, children have safe uh, access to the facility, as well as their, their parents and, and the staff. Uh, I know that there's a special meeting now planned for November 6th uh, to meet with the, the district, uh, the, the highway district, uh, to further discuss the, uh, the studies and the information. Um, I hope that goes very well, but uh, I'm, I'm not able to be there. I want to put uh, the MPO and the, and the highway district on, on notice that it's their responsibility to come up with alternatives to solve this problem and make sure that it happens. Not, it's not the school district's responsibility. You may have to pay for it, uh, and that leads me into the levy. Uh, I am a taxpayer here uh, in Coeur d'Alene, moved in here from the country a couple of, a couple of years ago. My wife's a uh, substitute school teacher. We're both kind of semi-retired, but uh, still working full-time, it seems. Um, she enjoys working in the, in the school district here and uh, is often amazed at how uh, wonderful it is and uh, how many uh, amenities uh, that you have compared to some other places that, uh, that she's taught and that, uh, that we've been. Uh, nonetheless, there's uh, always a need for, for more, and as others have uh, said in, in, in some detail, uh, you know, the costs keep going up, uh, the demands keep going up, we know the county's growing. Um, my comments on the survey, I, I think, uh, are in that 270 plus list. I didn't get through the, the whole list, but uh, I, I would agree with what some others have said. We really need to do uh, more to discuss what's being done with the money that we have where the new money is going, how this is not going to raise the, the rates or the, the actual taxes if the lobby stays the same, or uh, as some have suggested, we might look at, at raising it. I am amazed at how little I pay in taxes. And I make a fairly decent salary, um, not a salary, I'm actually in business for myself, but um, I eke it out. My wife uh, was glad to get the little raise, you know, that Substitute's got this year. It's not a lot, but, uh, you know, that's what she's chosen to do as opposed to getting a full-time job here or, you know, somewhere else. It gives us some more flexibility. But I think we really need to go uh, and dig in and provide the public with uh, additional information, additional detail. Don't think that we don't understand finances and that we don't understand what the demands are. We need that information. We need it uh, you know, publicly displayed. Uh, the levy a couple of years ago had some very nice flyers and handouts and charts and uh, frankly made more sense to me than the video, sorry. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I didn't but, feel well when I was yeah. recording those. <laughs> but good, good effort. But uh, let's let's keep at it. Let's let's really fight for uh, for this school district. And uh, I think, as others have said, you will have the public behind you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments. And that'll close up our co public comment period. Um, next is our consent agenda. So is there a motion to approve consent agenda items A through J? So moved. I'll second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 There was a, can you vote by hand? I think you have to, you have to say something. Sorry to catch you mid drink. Uh, <laughs> motion carries, Ms. Town. Okay, information items up here. Uh, first up is our finance report. It was included in um, our packet, both the, the board packet and the public packet um, as a board. Um, 
you may know, Miss Ebner's not here with us tonight. She had a baby this morning or today. So um, if it's okay, really, Miss Ebner's not here to, to present uh, anything. So if you have any questions, just follow up with Dr. Cook on what was in the report. Okay. It was a boy. <laughs> For the record. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that takes us to item B, which is uh, just an update on the elementary site. Actually, it's uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about all our facility updates. We've got a, a several updates of which the elementary site is just one of a few of them. So I'd like to have Jeff Voller come up, Director of Operations, and share that with you. Good evening, Chairman Morris Rowe, <coughs> Superintendent Cook, esteemed trustees. It's my privilege tonight to come before you and uh, give you the great news that both of our high schools have received their temporary certificate of occupancies. Uh, which means that they'll be taking possessions of the facilities. Um, and when I say temporary, basically what that means is there's a little bit of uh, a couple items left to do, but they are gonna be items that are gonna have to be followed up in the spring. So there's some planting trees that the uh, city's requiring. And so those have been bonded out um, and those will be followed up in the spring. So it will be, uh, temporary certificate of occupancy until uh, those projects are completed at which point they'll become final but uh, they're excited to be receiving their new facilities and I'm going to just show you a couple pictures here real quick uh, this is the entryway at Coeur d'Alene High School yep. uh, the, new, the new gym at Coeur d'Alene High School the weight room and the wrestling room on the bottom right and then at Lake City, this is the new gym at Lake City. Uh, and then the weight room on the left of the wrestling room. And those don't look quite as finished, but uh, they have some temporary floor coverings over that make them look not as finished that really are just a matter of peeling those back and, and those are pretty much ready to go. So uh, this morning we did a, uh, a walkthrough at Coeur d'Alene High School with the architect and he started to do the punch list. And we have a follow-up construction meeting tomorrow to review what that punch list is. So those are items such as uh, you know, just little things that need to be addressed and, and followed up with um, nicks, cracks, drywall, little things like that that they'll be working on over the next couple weeks, but uh, really is ready, ready for their completion. Um, and then at CHS, as the student body reported earlier today, that um, on Friday the 7th, they will be having their uh, grand opening. And that's gonna, my, my understanding is it's gonna be in between the girls and the boys basketball game. So it's home games for both teams and they're really excited to be playing on their new court and we'll um, celebrate that in between those two games. Uh, Lake City High School will have their punch list walk on Wednesday. So they are in those final stages as well. Um, and that's, that's it for the photos of that. Um, and then just to update you on some of the other projects. So Lakes Middle School, uh, we've been meeting with the architect and the contractor looking for cost savings measures. We've identified several of those and we believe we can bring it down to, uh, to do it within the budget. Uh, we have a meeting this week with the engineers to look for further value engineering options, which basically means it's, you know, can we trade this for that and, you know, save costs if we look at a different plumbing fixture or mechanical fixture type thing. So that's with the engineer for that. Um, the timeline for that project then would be, we expect to go out for bid the second week of January. We hope to receive bids back by mid-February, and we would come back before you at the March 4th board meeting to present our, our final options for that project. And then under your direction and weather permitting, we would target a mid to late March start on that project. Um, as you've heard, and I think as you guys know, the Prairie Avenue site, uh, we've had some challenges working through some access issues with the Lakes Highway Department. Uh, there will be a, a joint, or a, sorry, a meeting on Thursday, December 6th at 3 o'clock at the Lakes Highway Department. That will be their board meeting. Um, at that time, we'll, we'll essentially represent our request for access. And we have some proposed alternative options that we hope to present to them uh, that our team has been working on to come up with. So it's our hope to come away with a path towards an intersection agreement that will work for both parties. And we, that's our hope that we can come away with from that meeting. And at this point, I'll stand for any questions you guys might have. Um, do you know when we're gonna start talking about ad alternates? I was just kind of looking through your spreadsheet and looking like some of the projects may have some money left over. Um, is that something that we may do? What's your timeline like next month? Yeah, we can probably present that next month. We're fairly, you know, we're with these projects wrapping up now, we'll know, you know, really where we're at at the end of the high school projects now. Um, 
you know, so I should be able to have, I've got a lot of that put together and should be able to have something for you next month. Perfect. And do you have an update on how the Dalton PTO reader board all, did it get settled out and everybody's happy? Uh, well, there's a meeting on that today, and I think okay. there's I think there's a path forward. Is my understanding with that? Okay. So, um, you know, some some things that they need to, to do, but I think we have some options <coughs> that we may propose mm -hmm. to you guys here in the near future as well. Okay. I would just add to that that uh, um, I think we had a very uh, Dr. Roscoe and I met with their PTA board. This uh, actually their entire well, as many of their organization as could attend. Uh, and I feel like we had a very productive conversation and we've got uh, what I think is a, a somewhat of an agreement on how they can move forward and we'll be bringing some back to you um, here in the near future. So it's kind of in their hands at this point. but It, it just seems to clarify that too. Maybe this is the, you know, for our next board meeting, but it seems like who's getting reading boards and bond projects and who's not hasn't really been consistent in the past and maybe that created some confusion for certain schools or projects. But as I drive around the district, I see some schools have them and some schools don't. So down the road as we do future projects, maybe identifying if that's a need that we've determined the schools should have. Because um, I think it's been confusing where the PTOs are funding those. I know we funded some for some schools, some maybe other funds. So. Agreed, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, next up, item C is our maintenance and operations levy discussion. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cook to get us started here. So last month, if you recall, we presented, uh, Katie Ebner and I actually presented uh, a lot of conversation around possible options with re regard to the uh, levy request moving forward. As you all know, we are currently uh, in our second uh, go-around at $16 million. And uh, I, if you recall, I also stated that for the record, I'd like to see if it would be feasible for us to get feedback on a recommendation of going up to a level of $20 million potentially and seeing uh, what the community feedback would look like for the possibility of asking for that to be uh, placed into uh, perpetuity. And uh, we went out, uh, we developed a survey and s evidently some mediocre videos uh, to get feedback and give communication <laughs> to the public on uh, kind of the state of the district and how we uh, do some funding and, and, and how the local levy uh, supports the uh, money that we receive from the state with regards to funding the school district's general budget of about $75 million. Uh, just a little over 20% of that is uh, funded through local option and we are starting this idea of potentially looking to increase that and uh, so we I think had a uh, just over one day over two week window for people to contribute their feedback on uh, those questions, those very questions, up to and including uh, whether or not they're comfortable with the idea of levying any funds whatsoever for the school district. And some people uh, gave us comments on those as well. Uh, we felt like the survey uh, was answered almost or asked almost all of the right questions. There's one that we're going to talk about here in a little while when Scott, I turn this over to Scott, that we feel like might have been a little bit confusing, but we'll clarify that later. But we feel really solid about the data that we received. And uh, I think almost uh, 830 respondents uh, filled out the data with about um, roughly 300 comments of various nature. And so I'm going to turn this over to Scott. Scott's going to share that data and how we disaggregated that data for your guys' uh, purview. And then uh, our next steps would be to really just have a discussion on how we might like to approach going forward with, with uh, what decisions would be made and potentially, uh, I've also asked Danielle Quaid to come, uh, Holly Troxell attorney, to talk about possibly what ballot language could look like if uh, you guys were ready to talk about that conversation, depending on any amount. And so uh, she's going to talk us through that along with the pathway of what it might look like if we were going to try to consider uh, perpetuity, for example. So with, Dr. with that, Cook, yes. Did you say ballot language? Uh, not, not to approve ballot language. No, no, no. I, I heard battle language. Oh. And I just... <laughs> Wanted to make sure I heard it right. Yeah, she. So yes, Danielle is bringing ballot language, not battle language, uh, but with some of the comments that were in the paper, you, we could have both. So, 
Um, so we're thankful for her showing up tonight to help share that story with you as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Scott with also reserving the right to chime in as necessary. One thing I would add that since Katie is here, is not here, uh, I, I think um, I think we can do pretty much what she would answer with regards to the financial implications of decisions. I'll do my best, um, but if there is something we can't ask, then I'll uh, get the answers to those back to you. So, Scott. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Good evening, trustees and uh, Chairman Morrisrow. Uh, happy to um, present to you the, uh, an overview of the results from our, our uh, survey and as well as some other public feedback that we've received uh, in the last few weeks. Um, uh, let me get this going here. There we go. That's where I wanted to be. So um, this was an a online survey that we did through SurveyMonkey for approximately those two weeks in November. Uh, I'll just note that included the busy Thanksgiving holiday week, but we still um, got a pretty good response, I think. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 830 to 870 responses based on how you kind of track it because some people started and didn't finish but submitted it. Um, I won't. I won't. Uh, I won't mention the videos <laughs> again. But um, I. I do want to point out that the first three questions that um, uh, that we designed with the survey essentially um, asked um, the survey takers to acknowledge the videos that they watched them, whether they were helpful or not. So I'm going to jump in right after that uh, here in a minute with um, the answers that we received to question number four. Uh, but I, I just want to note that we promoted this. I thought pretty heavily. Uh, through email uh, with district stakeholder groups uh, on our website, social media, um, our mobile app, uh, through uh, news media. Um, so even though it was during that kind of that holiday period in mid-November, I thought we um, really got it out there in a good way and, and got a good response from the community. So with um, with uh, question four, we were asking for basically just a little bit of information about who, uh, who's taken our survey. Um, and people uh, could select as many of these options that applied to them. Uh, so that could have been three or four, or maybe even five uh, options. You'll see that 76% uh, are registered voters, 73% pay property taxes in our district. 59% uh, have kids in the district currently. 37% uh, work for the district and so forth. Uh, so then we asked generally if they think uh, that the levy today should be uh, decreased, maintained at uh, $16 million a year or increased. And so here uh, you can see pretty strong support, 68% for increasing that levy amount. Um, the 85 respondents that you see there um, on the top line for um, favoring a decrease, um, they basically, um, at that point in the survey, were taken to a, uh, a page where they could, uh, I mean, a question where they could um, tell us exactly at what decreased level for the uh, levy they would be supportive of. Um, and um, those responses, um, as you may have seen in the comments, varied widely. Uh, but everyone else from here on in the survey proceeded to answer some specific questions that we posed uh, for increasing the levy. Question six, uh, we asked about adding $1.5 million a year to pay for mental health programs. Uh, security enhancements, professional staff development, as well as some uh, more funding for individual schools, and about 88% said yes. Uh, we then asked about establishing, uh, excuse me, we asked uh, for, uh, about an additional $2.5 million um, for a total increase in the levy of $4 million. Uh, which would enable us then to improve pay for classified and certified employees and as you can see 82 percent said yes they would they would get behind that all right then we asked uh, about establishing the uh, maintenance operations levy on an ongoing basis rather than returning to voters 
for approval every two years. And you can see that 67% of the respondents favored doing that. And when we asked them to select a levy amount uh, that they'd support on that continuing basis, two thirds told us they'd be comfortable with setting that amount at $20 million a year. Scott, <coughs> yes. sorry, can I interrupt real quick? Um, just looking at those results, and I think the, uh, perhaps the question before that, the, the one on the permanency, thank you. Um, if I'm reading that correctly, those are just the respondents who on the survey said a yes, or increase or maintain, correct? Correct, so, at that point. Um, but, okay. but later we'll get back to looping everyone back in okay. together. Thank you. Yep. And so as I noted, um, we, we did receive a lot of comments at the end of the survey. Uh, this is just a graphic that basically shows you some of the um, frequent words that appear most often in those comments. Um, and there are a fair number of comments expressing um, some concerns or reservations about a levy increase uh, or, or even with the current um, amount that we have with our levy uh, or general questions of, uh, and concerns about how the district manages um, its finances. And so as I was thinking about all of that over the weekend, um, it, it does feel that the entirety of the comments doesn't quite match with the survey data that we're seeing that, sh that, that clearly shows a uh, pretty strong level of support for, for increasing the levy and establishing it on an ongoing basis. There's maybe a couple of things uh, that could help explain that. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that the 85 survey takers who right off the bat told us, no, I'm not in favor of any increase at all in the levy. Um, more than half of them did weigh in with commentary um, about how they feel uh, and not just providing us with a number uh, that they would support. So I think we're seeing a lot of those strong opinions expressed. Second, I think um, just again, those who have some maybe fundamental disagreements with the, with the supplemental property tax levy um, or who feel that personally their, their tax burden may be already too high or just have, again, uh, general concerns about um, uh, district finances. I think those folks are really perhaps uh, motivated to speak up at this survey and, and tell us exactly how they feel. Uh, maybe more so than those who are supportive of additional local support for the district. So with these next few slides, um, I break down the responses by some demographic groups, um, uh, as well as um, the public links that we shared uh, to give the community access to the survey. Uh, and at the bottom of each of these slides, uh, you'll see I included, uh, just for a reference, um, all responses. Th that's basically what we just went over uh, from the previous slides. Uh, so that's all responses from all groups. So in this, in this first one, we go back to question five and you can see um, support for the levy uh, across all these differing groupings with the one exception of those who use that community link. That's the one with the 157 responses there in the, in the right column. Um, so 60% of that group does not favor an increase. Um, maybe it's worth noting though that, that um, this community link group does represent about 18% of all of those who answered that first question. So here's how our different groups answered the question about going up 1.5 million. And uh, notice here that the number of community link respondents now drops by about 40 people. So that would have been 40 of those 85 then who, because of that, the, how they answered the first question, went a different track through the survey. But suddenly you see with that community link, um, there's quite a bit of uh, community, uh, or quite a bit of support there uh, for increasing the levy that was 73%. So I thought that was a pretty interesting development with that particular uh, demographic, if you could call it that. Um, next, where they stand on increasing the levy uh, by 
by uh, a total of 4 million, so 2.5 plus the 1.5 in the previous question. Again, support across all groups. Here it is, uh, establishing the, uh, the, or, uh, the question about establishing the levy on an ongoing uh, basis. Um, again, pretty broad support, except with that community link again, um, not really favoring that. And then finally, you can see here how nearly all the groups are indicating strong support for, for setting that um, ongoing levy amount at $20 million. So the, clearly that was the favorite amount that they were comfortable with. All right, so I'm calling this the big picture. So here I wanted to go back to, again, to uh, that first question, question five, grab those 85 solid no votes uh, and add them back in uh, to our final results um, for those four survey questions that, that, uh, that, didn't, that they didn't get a chance to answer those questions. Um, and um, those four questions, of course, the first two are dealing with the amount and then the other two questions dealing with whether we should establish that levy on an ongoing basis. So you can see that when we add those 85 no votes back in, we still are seeing strong support for going up and going permanent. Scott, are you saying the strong support is 60%? Because it's 60 yes, 40 no. Is that generally, am I interpreting that correctly? Yes, correct. And also, if you look down below that, 59% for the 20 million. So um, finally, the, the, we did um, conduct a couple of these um, levy conversations in the district last week. One um, on uh, last Monday at Northwest Expedition Academy. We had about 20, 20 25 people show up for that one and then a smaller crowd um, two days later at Lakes Middle School. And I just wanted to kind of summarize some of the comments and feedback that we were hearing. A lot of questions, more, more questions than comments really, I would say, uh, but generally supportive of uh, the, the concept that uh, Superintendent Cook was, was covering with them. Uh, this is where we definitely heard some confusion and questions on that one question about what does it mean to establish the levy uh, on an ongoing basis or uh, on a permanent level? Does that mean that you can never um, change it again? Um, so there, there was some folks who gave us valuable feedback that they actually indicated um, maybe they wouldn't support that because they were worried that the district would never be able to increase the levy again after the voters established that ongoing levy amount. Uh, so clearly we will, you know, if that is, if that is something, um, if that is an option that you're seriously looking at, we have some work to do, I think, to help educate the public going forward uh, about what that means, that, that, that there would be opportunities down the road to return to the voters if, uh, if the trustees uh, saw a need to change that amount. Questions? Okay, so why don't we, uh, if we have any questions in regards to the survey for Mr. Maven, um, why don't we get those handled here? Any questions on that? Okay. I don't have any questions. I think you did an excellent job, and it, it's not really scientific. You could have statistician challenge you on some of your things, but overall, and I thought it was interesting also, I think you have on those kind of surveys, you kind of get the extremes. What I mean by that is you get the people who really support the district can really want to increase it, and people are really opposed, as one of the speakers said, aren't going to support it no matter what you do. So I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure it's a real valid cross-section of the community, but I think it's a good effort. You did have a lot of respondents, and I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. It's not sampled. You, could, you couldn't get that through a dissertation as far as the sampling, but it's, yeah. you know, but it's a good information to us, I think. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, Mr. Maven, Dr. Cook, I'd just like to thank you guys for putting that together on pretty short notice. I think it was, you know, three and a half weeks ago or four weeks ago that we asked you to, to do this just to aid us in our decision making, so thank you. Uh, and I know Doc wasn't feeling too good there when he had to make put those videos together. Uh, uh, thanks, Richard, for pointing that out for him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we won't let him live that down. <laughs> But um, no, I, I appreciate it um, and um, I appreciate, I see Mr. Wilson over there from the Coeur d'Alene Press, I, I appreciate those folks helping spread the word and I know we did see a bump in those surveys after the editorial that ran, ran uh, last week, so certainly appreciate those folks for helping us. Can you, can you give a little idea on the, the community link portion or kind of who we shared this out with? Um, or what types of groups, yeah. maybe? Well, that c the community link um, was a link that uh, appeared on our on our website, and also uh, that we shared uh, with news media through a, a news release. Uh, and it's also the one that we used when we did some direct outreach with a number of different organizations and stakeholder groups in the community, political groups on the left and the right, service clubs like. Rotary, Kiwanis, Eagles, uh, Elks, um, some of the, the stakeholder groups that work closely with the district, like RISE and CEP and Excel Foundation. Um, I think there were maybe 20 some groups that we uh, attempted to do some outreach with. I, it's hard to know to what extent they embraced it and then turned around and shared it with their membership. I did get some feedback from some of the groups that they were doing that. Um, through the Chamber of Commerce appeared in their, their newsletter so um, even though in the end, the, num the total number of people who accessed the survey through those links was relatively small compared to the total number of people who took the survey, um, I, felt, I felt that there was definitely some community representation there that's not directly affiliated with the school district. In other words, um, they're not indicating that they're parents of students currently enrolled. They're not employees. There was some. We did see some of those folks choose to get to the survey through that link rather than say one that was provided through uh, direct contact. Um, but I think it's probably your, your best look at everyone who is maybe unaffiliated or doesn't have those direct uh, current ties to the school district. Is this information posted or will it be posted on our district website for the community to view? It, it, is, uh, it is posted with the board book right now, but I think tomorrow we'll definitely put it out in a more prominent fashion. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Maven? Okay, Dr. Cook, you uh, have some that you wanna add here before we Go or where are you going next? Yes. Yeah, let's. I, I do want to just add one commentary uh, that I think might transition a little bit. I got asked actually quite often uh, when I talked to people about this during the time that the window was open, where did the $4 million number come from? Why $4 million? Why not forty? Why not 400000 What? How did we get to that point? And I've struggled, <clears throat> excuse me, I've struggled across the district to explain the, the modeling we used financially to try to explain it in a way that made a lot of sense. Uh, and so I'll try this one more time and hopefully this will help. Um, in Coeur d'Alene, we are fortunate to live in, a, in an area that has a, a, a relatively low tax rate uh, and a large tax base. However, um, tax assessed values over recent years have gone up at a pretty substantial amount. And so taxes are computed based upon a formula and two parts of that formula are what make uh, this kind of come together. And if you recall, two, two board meetings ago, we put up on the, on the screen uh, the highest needs that we were hearing from the system in a spreadsheet form that allowed you to toggle and turn on and off how much you could ask for uh, for the following things. And so, uh, and that was pretty common. And if you recall, the, the things that we've kind of crystallized down to, the, the items that you see before us, things like building budgets and mental health and uh, teacher training and staff compensation were also in some form or another on that, uh, on that worksheet. 
And the, the number of 4 million came from a, a kind of a graph where the needs and the possibilities, uh, if we do a, a, a conservative modeling of where tax rates have gone over the last 10 years, not just tax rate, but actual tax uh, assessed values and uh, rates combining to form in essence what a projected model would look like and if you remember I spent some time talking about essentially what we were trying to do is come up with the sweet spot of what would this look like if we were going to try to tax only new construction and not uh, increasing the taxes for the typical homeowner and just have the typical homeowner see the as their assessed values go up uh, maybe the rate decreases at a, at a similar proportion, but make this base this modeling on uh, incorporating the, the new construction kind of percentage of <coughs> part of the total tax base into this. And that magic number when you run those two models together was the $4 million increase. Could we ask for more? Absolutely, we could ask for more. Should we ask for more? I think that's the conversation. You, you, the argument would be, um, what's the needs? And needs are going to depend upon the person that's talking about them. And so um, if you guys were to say, you know what, Dr. Cook, we're gonna, we're gonna ask for an additional 10 million and move the levy up to 26 million, I promise you I can find a way to spend that money that quickly. But I think this was a, a model in which um, we had needs on, on one axis, uh, combining with essentially, and, and I'm glad Katie's not here to hear me say this because it makes her bristle every time I do, but kind of theoretically this model was what could we do that kept essentially the, the typical tax player, taxpayer's tax bill as flat as we could keep it. Uh, and that's where the $4 million came, on, came from. We projected quite conservatively, we went back 10 years on the growth, that 6% growth, and that includes a recession. So for those people who are saying, I'm really concerned about the possibility that this continued growth may not be able to be sustained, that's one of the reasons why we went back 10 years. We didn't base this on the last three years, which I think the average was like 12%, but we, we did this through uh, a pretty substantial amount. And so I think it's important to note that the four, <clears throat> that the four million that is up for consideration today uh, comes from a lot of math that is really difficult to explain, uh, but hopefully makes sense uh, now that this is like the fifth time that I've tried to take a shot at explaining this. But the idea was ultimately to have something that wouldn't feel very painful to the typical taxpayer. So I think with that, I, I've, Scott's been around every time I've explained that and he just gives me the like, mm, like eh. It's better, I'm getting better at it. Definitely right. better. And the, the last one you noticed, can you back up one slide, Scott? See that first bullet on the, med on the, the, the November 28th meeting at Lakes Middle School? I did that explanation and the first bullet was a result of that and they just said, just keep it simple. Stop trying to explain all that. But I think it's important. I think it's really important to know and understand where the modeling came from so that the four million isn't just seen as this random number uh, that just was pulled out of a hat. It was really actually a significant calculation based upon data that Eric Herringer put, presented for us when we started talking about this process. So with that, uh, we can take the discussion to the next level and potentially talk about um, what's the board's preference on this and then uh, Danielle is ready when we start talking about what next steps might look like. Before I open it up, Dr. Cook, I just want to point out or maybe just clarify, but as part of that modeling and plan work that you did with uh, Piper Jaffrey, uh, knowing that we're a growing district, you've um, kind of that future forecasting has bonding capacity in there as well because we know uh, at least projections, Coeur d'Alene is going to continue to grow whether we like it or not, and we're going we're gonna to reach uh, capacity issues if we don't continue to add classrooms so it, it allows us to still uh, in the future consider bonds uh, with the community so we can address those facility needs that's correct so w one of the uh, other benefits thank you for I just totally missed that piece um, one of the other benefits of this ask is because of its conservative nature um, this doesn't essentially use up all of the the bonding capacity that the district has currently and uh, as we move forward and as we see needs for either, for example, refurbishing other buildings that need, to, need work or potentially building 
more schools or uh, doing additional facility work in the near future, uh, this doesn't necessarily negatively impact our capacity to do that. And, and that was one of the criteria to allow. Uh, it, in essence, if we asked for too much money, um, uh, what it could d then do is potentially decrease our likelihood or, or ability to ask the voters for bonds or plant levies uh, on top of the supplemental levy. And so uh, this still leaves uh, a reasonable amount based upon our projections to ask for things in the, in the near future or in the extended future. Do we have that slide with us by chance that talks about some of that modeling? What our bond capacity looks like if, when we want to do a capital project? Just I think it was several meetings ago. But um, nice uh, I don't think we do. I think at the time we ran it on three different models, and this one uh, was, remember, was based upon a fairly conservative proje projection at six percent. If you guys want, we can uh, we could bring that back at a future uh, meeting and have that contrasted with uh, the. I think it would be nice because I felt like the survey was really fantastic, and now in hindsight, as we're getting ready to have this robust conversation, the piece that maybe was missing is our future capital needs. And I appreciated uh, Chair Morris-Rose's comment: is this model allows for us to have a capital project within 18 to 24 months that could be substantial. It could be we know it'll be a second elementary school, could be a K-8, it could be a small high school. So, what does this kind of flexibility are we talking about? Because I'd be curious how the voters will feel when we come back with a substantial bond project within the next two years. Okay. So I think for discussion purposes, there's really two questions before us uh, as a board to consider. And so one would be the amount, and two is the perpetuity or the ongoing uh, request. So I think if you guys are okay with it, I say we have those as a, two separate questions and then uh, maybe that lends into with what uh, Ms. Quaid has there, um, and we can kind of see what those options look like and, and how we move forward. Um, I have some comments I'd like to make, and um, at the end of my comments, I'm not going to be making a motion, but I very well may make a motion at the end of our discussion, but not at the end of my comments. So I'd like to make a few comments. It's just kind of my thoughts about where we're at on the situation. And it gets us started. Um, I'm on a fixed retirement income, and my income is less, likely less than most people in the room, and I'm very aware of and very sensitive to property taxes. However, I also think it's important to realize that the school district is responsible for a fairly small percentage of our property bill. Unlike the city and county that can raise taxes without a public vote, the school district has to ask voters on a regular basis to fund our schools. I looked at my own property tax bill that we all just re recently received. Out of my tax bill, which I have here, and somebody can check my math, uh, Kootenai County gets 22.2 percent, the City of Coeur d'Alene gets 40.3 percent, the Highway District gets 4.2 percent, Kootenai Emergency Services 1.25 percent, North Idaho College 7.1 percent, the Coeur d'Alene School District Bond, which we just saw the projects that we're working on. 5.5% uh, and the Coeur d'Alene School District Supplemental Levy, 12.5%. The emergency levy that we just did, talked about in September gets less than one-tenth of 1%. One the school district, it's important that the school district, district's percentage of the total tax bill, at least on my tax bill, is 18.1%. Your percentages might be different depending on where you live, if you live in the city or not. I believe that the school district is unfairly blamed for the rise in property taxes. There are a couple of factors to consider when looking at the increase in property taxes that many of us saw on our recent tax bill. One is the assessed value of residential property, as everyone knows, has gone up in recent years by a significant amount. Se secondly, people need to remember that about four years ago, the Idaho legislature froze the homeowner's exemption at $100,000. The homeowner's exemption used to be tied to the real estate inflation index. So if the value of your property went up, so did the amount of your exemption. That legislative change increases your property taxes if your house is worth more than $200,000. And many people here probably have a house that's worth more than $200,000. The loudest voices in opposition to a levy I don't think are reflective of the voices of the community, which has historically generously supported our public schools. I realize that our number of children that are homeschooled or attend private schools or church schools, but the vast majority of children attend our public, public schools. 
And in my opinion, we have a generational obligation to support those schools for the good of these children, the community, and society in general. Our parents and grandparents and previous generations supported our public schools through property taxes and other taxes, and I think it is the obligation of us to do the same with our schools whether or not we have children or grandchildren in the public schools. President John Adams said many years ago, the whole people must take upon themselves the education of the whole people and be willing to bear the expenses of it. Due to chronically inadequate state funding, at least $1.2 billion of the cost of public schools has been pushed by the Idaho legislature onto the local prop property taxpayer in the last six years or so. Also, of the 115 school districts in the state, according to information from our State Department of Education, in 2017 and 2018, 93 of these 115 school districts had supplemental levies, totaling 194,704,000 statewide to make up for the lack of state funding. Supplemental levies account for one-fifth to one-quarter of Coeur d'Alene's district budget. They are hardly supplemental, but are essential to the operations of the district. It's important for us to remember that. We've heard the community's concerns about the needs in our schools. The potential levies include resources for security personnel, mental health staff, as well as increased wages to our teachers and other staff, such as bus drivers and kitchen aides and teachers aides and many others. I would like to be able to give our employees a much more substantial raise, but we can't do all of that on the back of the local property taxpayer and without a lot more help from the legislature. Our tax rate is significantly lower than many other districts in North Idaho and a dollar per thousand dollars of assessed value less than the state average. The increase in the levy as, as currently structured that Dr. Cook has presented will be paid for uh, by new construction and not affect their already low tax rate in Coeur d'Alene. In fact, the tax rate for the average homeowner will likely go down, according to Dr. Cook's calculations, by almost 5% if we approve the $20 million levy. So, I, um, so again, I would likely have a, make a motion at the end of our discussion, but I just want to lay out some of those thoughts and where I'm coming from. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hearn. Ladies, do one of you want to follow up, Mr. Hearn, with your comments? I'll reserve mine for the end. I'll speak. Um, <laughs> I, so I don't mean to be difficult. I guess my thought is I know that we have wanted to try to maintain a flat tax rate as opposed to, that was a lot of the discussions initially. And this discussion has been about actually reducing the tax rate. And I know that we have this sort of random 3.7% that came out and the 6% that came out for certified and classified staff. Um, and I think that was just a product of the 4 million and how do we divide that up and meet those needs and how does that work? So from my perspective, I mean, there hasn't, it's been really fast and so there hasn't been a lot of time to really develop more of these smaller pieces, but I'm interested, I'm not trying to tank not having some kind of action done tonight, but I'm interested in, and, and I know that there's potentially some opposition here tonight about even teacher salaries being a part of this, but I do support teacher salaries being a part of this. And I would like to see what would we, what would it look like if we were doing, and I know it's not still enough for many of our many of our staff and what people want, but even if we're looking at like five or six percent, are we looking, if we're looking at a 21 or a 22 million dollar bond, and that gives somewhat of the feeling of maybe a difference to people, um, I'd just be curious as to how that would meld into this, you know, tax rate that we're trying to keep flat, and maybe it doesn't reduce it, but maybe it keeps it flat still, and I just don't know the answer to that. So I'm curious about that, and then I will just end with a comment that, um, some, some of the folks that made public comment tonight, one of them, I don't recall who alluded to, you know, we are a city of excellence. And as unfortunate as it is from my perspective that our taxpayers have to bear the burden for our school district to be excellent, that is our reality. And I do very much appreciate the support that came in through the survey. I think that's very helpful to our board and the decisions that are being made. 
Um, and knowing that we're a city of excellence and knowing what I've just said about looking at possibly 21 million, 22 million and, and having that go towards um, salary increases, we do also have to maintain that excellence in our buildings and we are going to have to staff a future building and there is a lot more cost that truly is going to come to our taxpayers. So. I'm just throwing a big giant mixed bag out there, if you will, <laughs> for discussion, uh, because I recognize that the, that, that the percentage rate doesn't feel like it's very much, but I also feel that um, if we could just look at it and if it tips it too far, then wait, we bring it back to the 20 million and we don't look at any other possibility for um, salary increases. But I'd like to at least know what that is. But I'm also on a very conservative side to this because I know there's going to be a big ask coming in the next two to three years when we have to build a new middle school and a new high school. So I, can I ask a clarification on that? Yeah. So last month we ran models based upon options. Just, you know, if we kept the tax rate flat, if we let the tax rate decrease, um, but allowed, based upon projections and estimations, of course, allowed the capacity to increase at a higher rate based using that estimated model. And then the, this particular model was probably the most conservative model with regards to, uh, in essence, protecting the capacity for future t uh, asks, either through plant levies or bonds, to do that. So are you asking for overlaying the 20 million as a part of that and seeing the potential impact of what that would have at different rates uh, based upon the, the last sure. three, five, ten years? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. So we had a slide sort of like that. Um, we can, I can, I got you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Brumley. Ms. Mayor, Ms. Pickford. I'll go next. Um, yeah, I first want to thank the district and Scott for getting all this information. And uh, I think the comments for me were valuable. Um, I think the survey, as we've all discussed, attracted people passionate on both sides. We heard teachers and parents who fully support this measure. But we also heard from 85 people who did not support this measure. And I think if you dig deeper and you try to appreciate their perspective, um, they're probably retirees on a fixed in income. Or even more so, I heard in some of the public comments that people are fed up with how we're funding public education in Idaho. And for me, I fully support more um, money for our teachers. I support raises. I support increased in fun funding in general. But I'm struggling with how we're going about doing this. And I have to wonder um, if this is a Band-Aid for a lot larger problem. And our state constitution clearly lays out how we should fund public education. And I worry that we're taking a step in a direction that will be difficult to go back. And I think Washington tried this with the McCleary decision. Um, they were funding raises and um, just basic educational needs through their levies and it ended up in a, a lawsuit and I think we could be headed in that direction. I'm not saying I just don't support increasing funding but I, it gives me pause because I think levies are regressive taxes and I think those hurt those um, who are at risk the most and I, I can't help um, think about our retirees on a fixed income. We had a presentation at Long Range, Plan Long Range Planning last week and he talked about our largest growing population in Kootenai County and that is retirees. Um, they project by 2026 that they will be our largest population in Kootenai County and all of them will be on a fixed income. So I want us to see us come up with a formula that keeps them in mind. Um, and I worry about a capital project that, you know, in the near future. So I would like to see the models. I know we have them. And I'm talking a capital project that includes uh, elementary school and potentially that small high school or a middle school. I know that Danielle has some of that information for us and we can look at it, not tonight, but maybe in the future. But overall, uh, just a conversation in our community. Is this the right choice? Do we want to take this next step? Because in doing that, then we will be paying our teachers more, which I fully support. However, I don't support taking teachers from Wallace, from Ponderay, from communities that don't have the property tax base that we have to pass levies. And so in, ens in essence, are we all Idahoans in this together? We need better state funding. We have the ability to go out and 
make an ask. A $4 million increase, I think, is a fair ask. But is it fair for our smaller communities who are already on four-day school weeks, who can't pa pass bonds to refurbish their facilities that are falling apart, who can't pay their teachers? So we're saying now, come work for us because we can pay more. I fundamentally struggle with that issue. And I'm not saying I don't support um, the levy and a levy in perpetuity, but I think we have to be honest with our community. Maybe we work that much harder to go to Boise and raise awareness to the inequity in public education in Idaho. We definitely need to raise the awareness of publication and you know how, how it's funded here in Idaho. Um, I'm grateful for the survey. It was put together really fast. I mean, really fast. We were looking at the videos and I think we were all at a convention and making sure everything looked good. So I'm grateful for everyone that put in the time for that and for the community members that took the time to um, take this, the survey. We, we value your thoughts and what you have to say. And like others said, the comments were 50, I mean, I'd, we'd read one fully supportive, one completely against. I mean, they, there was really not much in between. Um, but I, I too would like to go back and look at those slides um, to see with the, uh, our future needs, t take that into account too. And um, we have a long ways to go, but I'm grateful for a community that continues to support um, our kids and our teachers, so. Could maybe you could help in this model, and you know we have some teachers in the room, or they could also help. But um, you know, if we do this levy and it's in perpetuity, and we're giving this you know said raise, we're not really keeping up with cost of living. We're not we're not really solving your problem that you're not earning a fair wage. And so I worry, are we just band-aiding this issue for five years down the road, ten years down the road, when we are, we don't have the ability to pass a levy anymore? Our school board changes over, things have changed, and how do we? ensure then that we're able to continue funding um, a set a set salary if we have to go back does that make sense if yeah yeah so th it almost leads into the the second part of the conversation um, the, putting the levy into perpetuity but essentially um, the board sets it, in essence by value sets the the amount that they are the maximum amount they would ask for from the local community and the local taxpayer the board at any given time can reduce that amount. And so even if it were in perpetuity, whether it's 16, whether it's 20, whatever the amount chosen by the board, uh, the board has the authority to back that off. Like, I think you could just, one year, you, I think it was even done that way. It was a tough year, and I think you guys reduced it from 16 back to 15. Uh, that is, that you're not giving up that right in the board, even if it's in perpetuity. Um, what you are doing by by stating whatever amount that you would want to go into uh, the year with at perpetuity is that's the maximum amount that is going to be levied on the taxpayer. If the board wanted to take act, so that that would happen. Let's say that passed uh, at sixteen million dollars. That means that you just no longer have to have the the ask every two years at 16. You still do not give up your authority to reduce the amount that's uh, to lower that amount, and the, you can still go back to the taxpayers to have it increased and ask for that. But if that increase fails, then only the increase fails. The 16 stays uh, in in place. Um, and so, as far as uh, if, if it were, there's two ways to answer that question. If, if the levy is in perpetuity uh, and some of the money that is coming from the local levy is going to fund salaries, um, that's not problematic because it ultimately is just one big pot of money that we would be paying that for. And so in essence, let, let's say that it was a 4% raise for all staff. We just wanted to give one consistent 4% raise and that, that spent out the additional funds. Um, as long as those funds are, are continued to be levied, that, that raise is baked into salaries. Um, if this were not voted into perpetuity and we were doing a two-year kind of recycle uh, cycle, then we would have to take a little different approach on this. We would have to, to do it in a way in which it wasn't considered a raise. It was probably more like a stipend for staff. And it would be a little more calculation, but it could be done. And in essence, if the, the local levy then failed or we reduced it, we would have to talk about what we were going to reduce, potentially concluding salaries, if we were going to either reduce or if it failed, um, what that would look like. So the, with regards to paying for salaries out of local dollars, 
um, there's definitely two different approaches that I think would be a consideration. So, And let me make sure I heard you correctly. So if the board changes and the board that's pleasure then is to stop the levy in perpetuity, which a new board could do, correct? Yeah. So then we've given a 4% raise three years from now, two years from now, the board says we've had enough. So then how do we have contracts then that go back to a, a, a salary that was prior to the levy in perpetuity? Does that make sense? Yeah. In, in essence, it's a... Uh, you're you're reducing the you're making a unilateral decision to reduce the pay across the board and the boards could, right. the could contracts are annual right so, yeah um, Dan you know, or Ms. Quaid um, on the if we move forward with perpetuity perpetuity ongoing I know um, I think what Dr. Cook was saying so let's say it's at 16 million the the local board basically elects we vote what how much we elect even right now where we have a supplemental 16 million that's every two years we could have said this year okay we're only going to assess for 14 million let's say correct so that's available um but the, the perpetuity would is ongoing is that correct i mean even if they that local board at that time chose not to assess or can they actually say okay we're done with perpetuity and kind of throw that out the window I'm going to pull up the statute here, which I thought I might need. So it says the levy approved pursuant to the subsection may be reduced by a majority vote of the trustees during any fiscal year. So I think the authorization would continue. That's what I was thinking. But the reduction could happen on a particular fiscal year. So I don't think they could get rid of the, the authorization forever. But they could reduce what is levied every year. Um, I have a couple questions or a couple comments, I guess. And one was just something that Lisa said just a minute ago about um, kind of using the local levy to fund um, raises. And, and essentially right now we are doing that, right? Because we know in our district a teacher makes about $10,000 more than what the state pays us for salaries. And um, you talked, well, what happens if, let's say, this we run this and whatever percentage raise it is for our staff how's that look in the future and, and how how do we continue to fund cost of living adjustments or raises and those sorts of things ongoing and, and it's essentially the way we're doing it now right because we're 75 to 80 percent of our budget is currently is is state dollars and the rest is is local dollars so you'd, you'd essentially be using those state dollars and i think we've been fortunate the last few years the state's thrown a, a lot more money into education over the last couple of years but it's really been catching up and getting us to levels we were at 10, 12 years ago. Um, so I think ongoing, you will probably be looking towards state dollars to fund raises, right? Hopeful state dollars. Um, you said something about, is it fair? And hell no, <laughs> it's not fair. Uh, you look at our district, uh, you know, I think I, I was calculating numbers here. So the state for the funding formula for next year has put in uh, dollars per general ed student at like 4,200 and change. $4,288 or something like that per, per general ed student. Uh, at an ask of $20 million, we're talking about $1,800 per student that we'd be adding onto that. So our district would be at $6,000 per general ed student. You know, other districts, the, the 12 or 13 that Tom said that don't have supplemental levies, they're gonna be at less than 4200 so no it's not fair there you know it's not it's not uh equal and that's unfortunate and that's a real disservice to our community um i i think what we as as the local board need to look out for is our local interests currently and Coeur d'Alene you know the wants and needs of Coeur d'Alene may be different than the wants and needs of another community and i think if you ask someone on the state they'd say how can you justify that eighteen hundred dollar you know difference amongst districts within the same state they'd say you know well, we're doing the bare necessities or we're you know we're doing the, the necessities Coeur d'Alene or those districts are choosing to add other things on and I'm not sure say our levy went away tomorrow uh, what are the non necessities that we're funding I think our community would flip their lids if all of a sudden we eliminated sixteen million dollars worth of programs um, and I'll tell you, and I've shared this with Dr. Cook and maybe with some of you, but 
you know, six months ago or 12 months ago, you know, I was really of the mindset, knowing this was coming, that the state's thrown a lot of money towards education, around $100 million a year over the last four or five years. They're talking about maybe doing that again this year. And, you know, our m and has continued to increase over, in that, over that time period. And I really felt, you know, our community's been greatly supportive of us and that, you know, we need to appreciate that support and maybe we need to look to reduce the m and and, and reduce some of that burden off the local taxpayer. I'll tell you in the last six months or 12 months, um, with the things we've seen go on, whether it's mental health issues or safety and security issues, uh, with what's happened in Washington and some of the quality educators we've lost, uh, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of this ask. And, um, you know, I'm willing, I, th I think we're taking a risk at, at the increase, but I'm willing to take that risk because I think it's the right thing to do for our students. And I think, number one, that's who we have to be concerned with with um, I think we did a training a few months ago and it was on the back of our name tags right it said think of the students or put students first I can't remember right we talked about painting it on the wall back there so we could all see it when we were sitting up here at the dais um, and I, I think that's what we need to do in this instance am I concerned about taxes absolutely I own a business here in town I have a home here in town I pay over twenty two thousand dollars in property tax between the two of those I don't like taxes as much as the next person Unfortunately, that's the system we're stuck with in Idaho. It's the way we fund things. You know, one comment that kind of always scratches my head when we run these m and levies or bonds is, well, I don't even use the schools. I don't have any kids here. I came from California. I came from there. Why should I pay schools? But, you know, ta the, Mr. Hearn pointed out these things. There's libraries, fire districts, ambulance service, North Idaho College. It's the way we fund things. My house hasn't burned down, but I still pay money towards the fire department every year. I've never ridden an ambulance. Couldn't tell you the last time I was in a library, but we fund things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's the way our model works in Idaho. Absolutely, I'd love to see the state fund more and to fund $6,000, let's say, per student. Even that would put us steer still at the bottom in funding. I, I just looked while we were sitting here to see um, where our neighbors were, and these, these figures are a few years old, but Washington, 6,600. This is just instructional funding. This is in 2016. Washington, 6,697, and we know they had like 20% increase last year. Oregon, 6,300. Montana, 6,700. Nevada, 5,100. Idaho, 4,300. Utah, 4,400. Uh, one, one side I looked at, Idaho's 50th out of 51, if you conclude the District of Columbia, in per pupil funding for instruction. And I don't think that's good enough for Coeur d'Alene. I know it's certainly not good enough for me. It's not good enough for my kids that go to school here. And that's why I support raising um, the, um, the m and to the 20 million. Could we go more potentially? Could we use more? Absolutely. But I think there's a fine balance there. I wrote a comment down here as I listened to our staff talk and it's, uh, you gotta walk before you can run. I think I was thinking of Melissa's little boy there. Um, sure, we could ask for more, sure we could use more, but you, we can't do everything at once. And I think it's a reasonable request. I think it's a responsible request. And I think it's the right thing to do for our kids and our staff. So that's where I'm at on the $20 million figure. I, I hear what you're saying about could we do more and what would that look like and I'm not against I guess looking at that but I do know you know if we're going to be in a March ballot we're going to have to move forward here within at least by next month right and I'd like to kind of say something I, I Ms. May I agree with much of what you said but what you're talking about really are structural issues what you're talking about are long-term issues that and I understand that but you know we can't wait for the state of Idaho to do something. I've been extremely patient about that. And all of us have been extremely patient about that. And we have a new governor who said is, he's going to commit some more money to public education. Um, and I am one of those people on fixed income. I, I re and the only reason that my wife and I can retire is our house is paid for. If it wasn't paid for, we wouldn't be able to retire. But we're lucky we've paid it off prior to retirement. Our income's not that great. And, and I know, and I looked at some of that stuff from the Department of Labor, 
about what's happening in this community. We're getting older, much more retired people are moving in, many more conservative people are moving in, which I won't get into the politics of that, but that certainly is affecting this community a lot, and it's gonna affect people's supportive schools. That's why the point I tried to make is that I think we have, it, as I called it, a generational obligation. I think we have that obligation where the people want to, it's been going on for a couple hundred years now where we've supported public schools, and I think we need to continue to do that. So I understand what you're saying. I, I, you know, are we, are, it's not fair. Uh, the funding formula in the state of Idaho is not fair. The, the, some of the rural school districts are really hurting. They're down to four days a week. They're not paying above the state funding, which is, you know, and I've, t I've talked to one of the trustees over in St. Mary's who said, you know, they lose teachers to Coeur d'Alene and Coeur d'Alene loses teachers to Spokane. And it's because we can, you know, and it's, it's a sad situation. It needs to be dealt with. We need leadership in Boise to actually take this issue on. But meanwhile, meanwhile, we have a community here. We have students that are in need. We have staff that are in need. We have a generous community. I frankly think we just can't, I understand what you're saying, but I think we have to act, do what is responsible. As, as Mr. Morris Rose said, that we have to do, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a responsible thing to do for our kids and, uh, and our staff, and I'm, I'm willing to support let me Let me that. just clarify that too, Tom. What I was you know, really getting at is I think that we can all agree that m and levies are a stopgap to allow Idaho mm -hmm. to continually inadequately fund public education. And yes, I care mostly about our community. I care mostly about our teachers. But I am an Idahoan now. I grew up in Washington. Are there times I wish I lived right across the border? Yes. But I care about Idaho. And m and levies are not going to solve the problem to fund public education in Idaho. And we're remiss if we don't talk about it. And we should talk about it more publicly. Because what's going to happen in our small rural communities, they are going to continue to suffer. And I worry about those people. And if I have the opportunity to, to start the conversation now, I will. And I, I feel bad for our, our smaller communities, because they do not have this opportunity to pay more, to build new schools. And that's simply not fair. I agree. It's not fair at all, 100%. It's, you know, there was a lawsuit, I understand, some years ago against the state, or its funding form, against the legislature, and the Supreme Court ruled, I, I, I could be corrected, probably Mr. Wilson could correct me, you could find it, but if I remember that there was a lawsuit, and basically say, you know, saying that we were not providing a, a fair education throughout the state, the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's true, and the legislature went, oh well. <laughs> they didn't, they, you know, they, there was, the Supreme Court didn't force the legislature to do anything. They just said, well, you know, the governor didn't take, show any leadership, the legislature didn't show any leadership. They kind of went, oh, well, I guess it is unfair. Hmm. You know, and frankly, that's, we have some major structural issues in the state, and it's unfair. As I pointed out, one point over a billion dollars in, in the cost of schools has been pushed on the local property taxpayers by the legislature. You know, and that is not responsible, in my opinion. That shouldn't, that's not fair. But some of the legislators, I've talked to legislators who say, well, you know, folks, if you want those services, you should pay for them. You know, I said, well, what is your obligation? Well, we're doing the best we can, you know. So frankly, I, I and I think that that's really a, uh, there's a major structural issues here, but we're, the question before us, of course, and we all know this, and I'm not trying to, I'm not pointing at anybody in particular. I'm just saying the question before us is, what do we do now with the problems we have now based on a system which is unfair? One other thing I just wanted to mention, I wrote down here, uh, Ms. Brumley, you, you talked about the, f the flat tax rate. And, um, you know, I think that was a model that was really introduced to, to our district and to a lot of districts around the state a few years ago. That was, um, I, I assume, kind of Piper Jaffrey that advises most of the districts in the state, um, that that was a model that they chose to run with. And I think on a statewide level, it probably makes a lot of sense, right? Because statewide, um, you know, growth is probably what, what we see is historical. Uh, you know, we know where we are, 6% or something like that. Statewide, it's going to be much less than that. And, you know, maybe 2 or 3%. I don't know. I'm just kind of speculating there, I guess. Um, I think where that flat tax rate runs into trouble in Kootenai County is we're seeing 12, 13, 14% assessment increases or valuation increases. And that's... Th that's part of how we've been able to do what we can, right? But, you know, those are, those are big hits. Um, 
you know, if, if we would have stayed with a flat rate the last couple years, and even that's what our plan was, but our rate's gone down a little bit because the assessments have been so high, or the valuation's been so high. Now you're talking 40% increase in our bonding potential, right? Just over the last three years. Would Bruce love that? Yeah, look at his eyes are twinkling right now. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think we need to be responsible to our taxpayers while doing what's best for kids. And so to me, this is kind of a happy medium of that. We're increasing our funding. We're going to be able to offer more programs, offer some raises for our staff who have bared with us through some challenging times. And we're going to be able to reduce the rate for the average homeowner. And I think if the calculations and hopefully, um, you know, with assessments recently coming out, maybe we can pin that down a, a little more now that we know what the actual value is instead of speculating on what the value is going to be. Um, we might be able to model a little better as to are we really going to see flat taxes or are we going to see slight increases or slight decreases? Um, you know, I, I think based on the modeling, it was pretty conservative, so we're probably going to see flat taxes for the average homeowner. I, that's super hard to predict, right? Because there's tens of thousands of homeowner or property owners in the county. But then we could probably have that by the next meeting, couldn't we? Have some have that model with what uh, Chair Morris was talking about, because we have new evaluations are back. Um, I I don't know if we can do it based on the new evaluations, but I think we can do it based upon what we believe they are, um, and I think that's the the best we could hope for. I don't know if we can get a collective on that or not. Um, Seth, Seth found our last presentation from the last board meeting. If you want him to pull it up, the, the one that I would, hey Seth, can you go to the, uh, the slide with the answers? Okay, there you go. We're in the, so this is the first model, if you recall. And this was the one that was going to uh, um, yeah go ahead and scroll to the next one so this is a flat tax rate and this is based upon a six percent growth and what what you're noticing in the blue bar if we push all of that towards uh, salaries is the increase in capacity so the blue bar is the increase in capacity if you're pushing the, the money towards salary. So what you can see, so for example, at, I think that says 2029, 2020, what's the first? And what's the first blue bar in which it looks like it's about 5 million? That's, that's 19? I can't see. Two months ago. Okay. I think Eric Herringer was here both months, right? I think he was here October and November. Yeah. Oh, well, that was our workshop in. And that's at 223. That's at that tax rate, and that's at six percent. So your excess capacity at 20, in 2022 is already. You can see there, it's about two, three million dollars, and it just starts to dramatically increase as the, as the six percent rate increases and as uh, um, as we start to pay off certain bonds right can you just go to next model Seth okay go ahead yeah now in this model this essentially allows the tax this is at this is increasing to four million and this is a uh, what is it 34 million we asked for we just speculated because we didn't have any specific direction let's just throw a 34 million dollar ask out there and that allows us to fund that like if we were going to do this this march i i want to say for the record we haven't i haven't heard any intention to ask for 34 million dollars in taxpayer dollars for bond but asking for the four million additional in supplemental and a 34 million dollar bond still allows the rate to decrease and pay off those and so what you're doing in this model is allowing the rate to drop while still maintaining at least uh, uh, so the capacity at that point and you have a little bit of excess in that first year 
and then it flattens out because we're allowing the rate to drop. So that flatten out happens. Um, can you do the, the third model? Right. Right. And so what you will probably see, so in these models, we base this on the next 30 years if we did one ask right now because we can't necessarily speculate. But the idea is let's take, what is it, 231 was our last rate, I think, right before the beginning of this year. And then it, uh, if you are going to ask for a $4 million increase, so take the supplemental up to 20 and ask for a $34 million bond the following year in 2020, um, you and then you can still allow the the tax rate to drop equivalent to hopefully at that six percent uh model so i want to mind you you know that if if rates go up to assessed values go up 12 13 14 percent you're going to see an increase in taxes but when you do the tax capacity it will also increase and so you're seeing that that gives us the bond capacity and the supplemental capacity to uh take well, 34 million would you could build a you could build an elementary school for that. You m arguably could build a small middle school for that that amount at that rate, and depending on how many other funds and things you would need. So, in essence, what you're seeing is that you're protecting the capacity uh, by allowing the rate to drop. Even I think at the very in the, in uh, that's if you look that that goes all the way down to a dollar in 2040 just at a six percent rate of uh, increase in the assessed value so uh, ultimately if you guys want us to put together a presentation which overlays that we could do so again and do if we wanted a specific amount uh, you know the, that was one thing eric kept asking us was what's the amount on the bond or the plant levy or those kinds of things and we were like we 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 don't know we know we're going to have needs we're just not sure so the important thing on this particular uh, presentation was the fact that number one the four million is accounted for ongoing and there's in all three models the capacity remains protected so that in future years we have the taxing capacity if we needed to to go for a plant levy or bond levy for facilities and then thirdly I just lost my train of thought um, it'll come back to me Maybe it won't. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm willing to make a motion. I'm also willing to put off for another month, if that's what the will of the board is. What? So we also, yes. we still have Danielle. I think there's an opportunity to answer some questions about language and perpetuity, and we want to make sure we take advantage of her while we've got her here. Yeah, I think... Um, and maybe you have a better sense of this, but I'm a little confused maybe what Ms. Brumley's request is and are we, um, you know, where we're all at, I guess. I'm sorry. I guess since the only scenario that's been presented is this one, I'm just, I would just like to know, since this one allows the tax rate to actually, or the amount your tax fall, I, I'm interested in what happens if we add a couple million to it. So make the bond or make the levy 22 million, and what does that do, based on projections to the tax rate? Does it still slightly fall, just not as far? Does it raise it? It makes a difference to me because I think one and two million is substantial for where we're at in terms of this ask, and I don't. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know that one or two million will make a huge difference to our public support in light of what we're asking for. Um, but if it's substantial enough that it would, that it's defeating our purpose of trying to keep it flat or lower it, um, I just don't know. And that's what. So I'm more confused now. So do you want me to run these numbers at 22 million to see what a six million dollar? supplemental levy would do to taxing capacity uh, based upon this projection and, and mind you we're assuming lots of things in that particular model we assumed a six percent average which is the average over the last 10 years and so i think i want to make sure i provide the information you want to see and so the, the question i would ask is 
I think it's one of two things, because my original comment was about going from this 3.7 to a 5 or 6% raise for certified staff. And I didn't know if that equated to 1 million or 2 million. So that's then where I said, well, OK, what if we just look at what 2 million does? But I think I need both questions answered. What's the cost if we did slightly more in salary raises? So a, a salary raise for certified staff is about 330000 for a percentage. OK. Um, unless we give big raises, then you have to, you know, that's not right? Is that, is, am I low? OK. <laughs> I, Katie, Darn. dang it, Katie. That's a great number. <laughs> six, is it 630? Yeah, never mind. All right, never mind. Scratch that. Um, so I'm, I maybe we need to have Seth pull up. We had that ran because I remember we asked, Scott asked the question about well, when the calculation. The, it's on that calculator. That calculator, yeah. Does anybody remember off the top of their head? You guys remember? Or could. Can Seth, well, I have that calculator on my computer. Yeah. Do you want us to give you feedback on which ballot option we're liking, or do you just want us to? So I interrupted. Please give me your question back. Let me know so I can at least know exactly what we. So two questions, I guess. On, the, on a high side, I'd like to know what a $22 million bond levy would do. And on a more specific note, what is the amount it costs for each 1% raise we would incorporate into a levy. So 20, what you say, what a $22 million would do to, to the capacity, the taxing capacity, or as how we would spend it? No, the taxing capacity. Okay. And I guess seeing that, going back and looking at the 40, $34 million bond that we were talking about, <laughs> I guess I'm just concerned that that's not enough. I mean, if we want to look at real numbers, I think we need to be looking at eighty or $90,000 bond and what's that going to look like for the taxing capacity down the road. A potential middle school or small high school, just to see what that would do to the overall numbers, I think is what, is that what you're looking for? I guess I'm confused. We don't even have a recommendation from long range planning. It, the last one we do have says we need another, another elementary school. So why are we worried about a potential middle school or high school that we don't know about at this point to make this decision for this year? So I guess I'm just confused why we're. I think what the we're, point of that I is. think, or at least for my understanding, is how does it affect the overall? You know, because the plan is to keep dropping the, the overall tax rate and building capacity. So what does the capacity look like if we wanted to run a bond in 2020 for the second elementary school, which we know we need, and we know that our middle schools are at capacity or over, and we know our high schools are at capacity or getting close. So factoring that in, and I think we already have some of that modeling done. It's just well, not. I mean, you have it. Yeah. On this slide he has here. It, at a $4 million increase, assuming, what's that say, 5% growth, you would have bonding capacity of $54 million in, I don't know when that is. So what's it about the date? This is, this is Eric's presentation I think from two months ago. Right, that's in 2020, 2021. Originally, he had it a little further out, and then he moved it up, I think, at our request um, on the elementary school. Did we figure out how much it well, costs I, for a percent? Do you have, to make you have a, that calculator on your computer? We have to make a motion tool? tonight or not. I want to wait until we have uh, Ms. Brumley's information and other questions that have been asked or answered. Well, our drop dead date is next meeting, right? We have to we have to make that decision to get it on, right, Miss Town, to get it on the March ballot. I think it's January twenty first. January twenty second is the deadline to have the resolution with the ballot language, the okay. approved resolution to the county. So I can hold off. I don't. I don't need that information for my decision, but I think it, for future discussions, I think it will be important. Yeah. I don't need it either for my decision. I would like to know on a higher levy amount. That being said, I don't want it. If we brought a motion tonight 
the only reason I wouldn't vote for it is because I would be interested in what we could look at more. It's not that I'm not supportive of doing what's at the, on the table. All right, I think Dr. Cook has found the, the calculator tool that we used here a few months ago, I think in workshop. I think it was in workshop that we did that. Um, So a certified salary increase of 1% is about $460,000, Scott Travers, with a nail in it right there. Thanks, Scott. And a, and a classified salary increase of 1% was about $154,000. So an overall, if we wanted to get, what was the number, Jen, that you were thinking? What is it for them? Total? Um, Seven hundred thousand. So a seven, seven hundred thousand per one percent, for both groups. So would you say a five percent, and a six? So a five percent would be three point five million. Turn your mic on. I'm sorry. So an overall cost of 5% total cost for everybody, everybody would be okay. 3.5 million. Okay. If you wanted to go 6%, it'd be 4.2 million. Let me add one factor in this. When it, when it comes to just a raise, we're only, right now all we're considering is local dollars. We're not talking about any amount of money from the state. Last year we got, 2.8 million, I think, from the state uh, as part of, I don't know, I think they it was right at about 100 million, I think. Uh, and, and so I think last year it was one and a quarter for certified and 1.75 for classified. Is that right? One quarter, one and a half? One and a half and one and a half and one and a half. Okay, one and a half and one seven five, um, respectively for certified and classified. And so this doesn't take into any consideration any money from the state. So the, and I think that was one of the things we talked about last time was this is excluding that. So this is, the, this, these recommendations at four million, um, giving as much as we could give as raises along with, you know, in theory, whatever we could afford to give based upon state monies. Last year, I think 2.8 million uh, several, much of that went to benefit increases, uh, insurance cost increases in special ed, and I think additional staffing. So, okay. Sorry about that confusion. We need Katie. We, we need Katie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, on the amount, I guess given what Dr. Cook just said, is anyone? interested in more than 20 million I guess I'll put it that way I, I know Ms. Brumley was kind of asking that question right what would it look like and uh, I guess I in the in the essence of getting to a decision it, no offense Ms. Brumley but I don't want to have us wait 30 days to answer a question that only one person is interested in if that were the case Well, I'm definitely interested in the 20 million. I, I'd, I'd like to, I would actually, as, as Ms. Brumley's been talking, we'd like to have some of that information. So I guess I'm kind of, kind of uh, backing you up on that. So that's two of us. I might be willing to go above 20 million, but I, I was prepared to make a motion tonight for 20 million, but I can hold off. It, we didn't get feedback outside of the $20 million window. We've got feedback at 17.5 and then at, we have a feedback with regards to 16, at 17.5 and at 20. Um, I don't know if that matters. I think that was just on the, kind of the modeling that you had done and I think the feedback from us previously. But. Okay, let's talk about ballot language here, why that's, Fermenting. 
I, I will say the ballot language, I think number C is really clear. I think it's nice that whatever the amount is to be determined, that it's separated out the, um, in the indefinite part and the every two year part. So I think that's clear and concise and would be um, easy for voters to um, interpret. Could we just, Can I, I appreciate that. Can we just back that up, uh, Ms. Quaid, and maybe just have you walk us through kind of what you've uh, given us here. I see it's on the screen now, and maybe we just start from the beginning. Sure. Um, members of the board, I, Dr. Cook asked me to provide some different scenarios for what the ballot language could look like because, um, as you know, the, the, it's important to send people into the ballot box knowing how they're going to vote. But when they get there, we don't want them to be too overwhelmed by the language. And so some of the options that have been kicked around have been fairly complex. So we wanted to actually put before you some examples just that we came up with of potential solutions um, and ballot language that would go with them so that you can see what people will be facing when they're in there to do, make their vote. Um, so the first one is probably the most simple, and it is a $20 million, and it could be any number, right? If you came back at whatever number you all select, you could fill in the blank there. Sorry, I'm getting feedback. Um, but it, and it's in perpetuity. So that's, assuming you want to go that route, that is the most simplistic version of the scenarios that we came up with. Does anybody have any questions on that ballot language? So that's approved approving amount indefinitely or approving ongoing. any amount you select indefinitely yep. that's what the language would push. look like and you see that there with the each year for an indefinite number of years commencing fiscal year july 1 2019 that um exactly tracks the statute which is the 33802 sub 5 which is the permanent um supplemental statute so then if you turn to the second set of questions um this is a little in this scenario, we broke it up into two different pieces. There was been some discussion of that in prior meetings of voting the the 16 million, which you guys have used before, and then having a secondary question where you voted an increase in that amount so that you would hopefully protect that 16 million and then see how people thought, how people felt about the additional amount. And again, the amounts could be, you know, any numbers. We just filled them in with what, what we were thinking at the time. Um, there's, so there's a, the first question is just 16 million and that's again in perpetuity, the two years could be subbed in there. Um, but then question 2A and 2B both um, provide the $4 million supplement or the $4 million addition um, for an indefinite number of years. So they're both again in perpetuity, but the difference there is that in 2A, um, we give a broad authorization where that $4 million can be used for any purpose. And in 2B, it's more limited to some of the things that you've been discussing. So if you wanted to create that contract with the voters where you limit that second piece to um, some additional specifics, you could do that. You can see there it says teacher compensate and staff compensation, mental health programming and staffing, and safety and security staffing. And those could be anything the board chose to include. Typically, you see what's above, which is for the purposes of paying all the lawful expenses of maintaining and operating the schools of the district. So that's the broadest authorization you can have, and there could be anything in between. How does option 2B get away from that? encumbering a future board uh, provision that that we're up against do you know I mean aren't we are we kind of sticking them with that in essence I mean I, in the same way that you're sticking them with whatever dollar amount you select I suppose I mean you're taking it to the voters I think is different than encumbering a future board it's not you the trustees that are making that decision it's your voters okay thank you so then the, uh, the section C the the, fi the final two ballot questions that we came up with. Um, this is where the first two years, question one is voting $20 million for an indefinite period of time, so again in perpetuity. And then question two is voting $20 million for just two years, making clear there at the end that the authorization for question two would not be utilized in the event that question one passed. So in that case, you would vote it in perpetuity on the same ballot with a second question that voted it for two years. But if, if both passed, you obviously don't get 40 million, you only get 20. <laughs> that, that is one where I feel like there's some complexity. I mean, we tried to make it as 
um, simple as we could and clear that that second authorization wouldn't be used. But um, I can see people showing up in the ballot box and thinking, well, what does this mean and which one should I vote yes on and should one be a yes and one be a no? Um, we definitely need some voter education if you chose to go this route. I mean, you think back to that comment from Lakes and I think a simple and positive is a good route for these types of situations. And just for clarification purpose, the voter threshold on the ballot measure, whether it be in perpetuity or on the two-year cycle is? Just a majority vote, 50% plus one. Thank you. Either way. Yes. Thank you. Moscow was the last, last district to do the levy in perpetuity, is that? I don't know that they were the last district to do it. Recent. They are one of our clients who does have a levy in perpetuity. And the way that they do it, and there's no rhyme or reason to this, but they choose to increase it on a seven-year cycle. So the statute provides you have to have 20% of your budget come from these levy funds for seven years prior to voting a permanent levy, which we know you have met that threshold. But I think they've just chosen to keep it on that same cycle. So they tell their voters, every seven years we're going to come back to you with an increase in the perpetual levy. And they've been successful with that, and they've had several cycles of increasing their levy in perpetuity. So do you recommend that we would, if we wanted to go in perpetuity, that we go that route, or is it provide, I mean? I think that you really have to look at the individual needs of the district and um, kind of assess how long you can, you can live with an amount, and that, a lot of that comes down to what your amount is, right? And that was some of the confusion, I think, on the survey was, so do you have a comment on how long? Yeah, I just want to make sure this is abundantly clear. We've got uh, quite a few comments. I don't know, I think maybe between 10 and 15 in there that people who were generally supportive of the idea of getting more, but f that, that believed that when we said perpetuity, it meant that it was forever. And so their concerns were actually in the long term, whereas, oh my gosh, uh, what if we needed more? And this is not a large enough ask for right now. And so part of our... Uh, feedback and Scott mentioned this in his presentation was specific to the idea that we would need to do some informational camp campaigning uh, whatever you want to call it but making sure it's clear that this is yeah educating thank you uh, making sure that people understand that this is specifically about right now and that the board would still always maintain the authority to ask for an increase if that were interested well some if I could just add that there are some districts who have charter levies like Boise and uh, Lewiston and they vote supplemental M and O levies on a two year basis also. So you could always add if you had a special project or if you had something like that going on, you could always add a two year levy in addition to the option to increase your permanent levy at any of the election dates. And I I, I wanna remind you, um, at our last meeting Director Brumley asked a question regarding the the uh, urban renewal authority and the impact and there's you recall there's a statutory glitch that allows uh, voted levies are based upon the tax base and the the base in urban renewal and a non voted levy uh, is only based upon the tax base so there would actually be uh, an issue that we would have to address before and it would be my recommendation before we were to go to a permanent levy that we had some kind of an agreement um, with the urban renewal and to ensure that taxpayers dollars are being fiscally managed to make sure and I uh, we Danielle had graciously offered to help with that and, and uh, Tony Burns and I have had a conversation and just as recently today and said um, that they his board he, he is not concerned about that he feels like his board would be willing to listen to a conversation and potentially come up with an agreement. And I think, I think of the five districts in the state that currently have some kind of levity and perpetuity, four of them have formalized some sort of an agreement with the urban renewal authorities in their, in their region. Danielle, is there anything you could add to that? I think you're right on target. I mean, I don't have anything to add. I do think that the urban renewal board would be, um, willing to have that conversation and I do think you know education is a big part of their purpose too because it's all about economic development and certainly education is a critical you know leg in that stool so I I don't think that you would have trouble discussing that matter with them what percent what is it again that we're talking about what was the percentage that the amount of money that they could was like two I don't know the numbers offhand but I 
It seemed like it was a couple of million, didn't it? it uh, it was, I want to say 7% is a ring and a bell. I don't know. I'm, They're about to have their Scott, largest... Scott, do you know? Um, I do know that they're about to have their largest district roll off in 2021, so that would dramatically reduce that. But this is an unbudgeted item for them, right? They're not expecting to get these funds. Um, I don't see that as them being territorial. And, and ultimately, I think the idea was that this, even with the with Ignite CDA, would be a, a, a temporary solution until the legislature has a, legislature has a chance to address its its simple language issue um, but in the meantime it would be well served for us to have that agreement in place before we would uh, suggest that if I if I can since I haven't been to a library in a long time I'm gonna try I want to put this in non doctor non uh, attorney language to make sure my understanding is right maybe any other out there uh, so currently the 16 million dollar maintenance and operation levy that gets divvied up between all property owners within our district boundaries whether they're in the URD the urban renewal district or not right because of a glitch in the way the law is written if we went perpetuity the amount 60 million 20 million whatever it is would be divided up amongst the non URD residents right I mean the the, the URD people still get the money but that money go or they still get levied but it goes to the URD right so what would ha happen is that your levy rate would have to be higher to enable you to collect the same dollar amount because some of those levied dollars in for the increment, you know, and the, the value above the base value would go to their urban renewal agency. So you'd be looking for them to do some sort of a rebate right. back. And, right, and so what, what you're proposing, and I know uh, you and Tony have talked a couple times and I think he's indicated potentially this month we could get that uh, ran by their board would be to basically have a formal written agreement with them agreed upon by both boards where um, they would agree to pass that money through so it wouldn't negatively impact those not in the URD. That is correct that and it would be my recommendation that that agreement is in place so if this is something that the board is considering uh, moving forward I would ask that we do it conditionally on, on approval so that that give us a chance to develop that agreement I think we needed to have this conversation first and so uh, you can give us marching orders on how we would have that conversation with them and potentially develop uh, a joint agreement that would allow for that those uh, funds to, to essentially reach the school district. That otherwise wouldn't if we don't have that agreement. So on the ballot language here, I guess on the perpetuity, I wouldn't support that without the URD agreement which I know that's what you're recommending as well um, but what are other people's feelings I guess on these couple options I heard Miss May weigh in earlier about um, C and this the two question model there I have a question for Danielle first I would want to know what your recommendation would be if you have one and two with the exception of option C if you don't then in these other two options put the um, you'd be okay with the 20 million for two years do you just leave it to perpetuity or nothing right you would um, you'd have to take it back so if it didn't pass you would have to bring it back in May or August okay um, in terms of rep recommendation, I'm going to give you the lawyer answer. You know, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. It it does. I, I think that to the extent it's possible to accomplish what you want with a more simplistic ballot, I think that's absolutely the way to go because it is confusing. I mean, we all I write these and I still show up at the ballot box and I'm like, what are they trying to ask me here? And maybe I'm overthinking them because I do write them, but um, you want to send people in knowing how they're going to vote and not confuse them once they get there and i i'm just concerned that they would especially on option c where they don't know if they should vote yes on both or yes on one and no on one that it would split people up um unnecessarily i think there's a better and more explainable story with the splitting it you know 16 4 or 16 6 or whatever the answer is but even then you know you take the risk that you divide you give people the option to opt out of the increase 
What about if we, if the question was phrased such that, you know, whatever the amount is, we determine. So the first question is, do you support raising the levy to X amount? The second question is, do you support making this amount permanent so that you're not having dollars amount under both? Because I think for me, that comes back to the question on the survey, there was 60-40 split. 40% said they don't support permanent levy. We have two very distinct issues here. We're increasing the levy one, and we're asking for a levy in perpetuity, which we have never done here before. I don't want to jeopardize our levy dollars because we need those. But I'm also willing to give it a shot that maybe we can have a levy in perpetuity. But I think the voter should Need or deserves the option to make that decision. And if we narrow our ballot language so much, we're taking that decision away. So if there was a clear way to have that on there that here's the dollar amount and here's do you want it permanent or not, could it be that basic? The tricky part is that the, the ballot language has to track the statute that's authorizing the levy. And those statutes, you know, specifically say you have to include the dollar amount and the amount of time, et cetera. So I don't think you could get away from having kind of fairly similar to what we have here. I mean, we'd certainly be open to looking at this and trying to make it more clear to the extent that's possible. But, you know, you see that those, um, the sections of the code are included there and the language tracks that because it has to. So I don't think we could say in the first question, you know, do you approve a levy in the amount of 20 million, but not give the time frame? And then in the second question say, do you want it in perpetuity or, or, for, or two years or, I, I, it'd be hard. Mm -hmm. It just—it's really tied to the statutory requirement for what has to be in the actual ballot language, as well as the notices that are provided. <coughs> Other thoughts on the ABC options there, as far as ballot language. It well, Mr. Hearn. Well, I'm just going to say I'm in favor of. Uh, I'm going to make a motion to set the levy amount at $20 million uh, a year and set it, it in perpetuity. One question. So that's actually, I'm going to make that as a motion. That's a motion. I was going to say, I asked you a question, that was a motion. I don't see it. Uh, would that be conditional upon reaching the agreement with the URD? Yes. So Mr. Hearns made a motion to set the MNO levy amount at $20 million uh, and have it be one question, I guess? Is that what you're? Well, I, I, my understanding is you can't make it very easily two questions, right? I mean, you, well, that's what, that's what option like C. C looks like. Well, that terminates it after two years, though. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. No, so the first question there is $20 million in perpetuity, and then the second question is $20 million for two years, and it's limited at the end to say that to the extent that Question one passes. Question two's authorization would not be utilized by the district. So it kind of gives you the either or scenario. If you don't support it in perpetuity, then do you support it for two years? Can I ask Danielle a question while this motion's yeah. still out there? Do you think we run a risk if we phrase it like that? Because I do believe offering voters the option for a levy in perpetuity is for me, paramount. But if we run it like this, do we risk splitting our votes? So we might only get 30 on one and 20 on the other, and then we, neither one of them passes? Is that a possibility? I think it is a possibility that there would be confusion and people would vote for one or the other. I'm, I think that there is potential to solve that with education, um, but it would be very important to educate people about what's ha you know why the two questions are there and this, that the second question is to give the alternative of you know, if you don't support it in perpetuity, supporting the dollar amount on a shorter term basis. That's why if the questions were phrased such that the first question was, do you support a levy in X amount of dollars? If, you know, do you see what I'm saying? It seems like- So we could flip flop them. We could flip, and in fact, the first time I drafted them, we had them in the other, we had the first one first, but then I felt like you were going out with what you didn't want as the first question. So. Some of that's just the psychology of it, not really the law. But you could have the first question be, do you support $20 million for two years? And then if you support that, do you support making the levy permanent? Danielle, what's the risk of losing voters that don't understand the education that would, would say, okay, I'm asking, they got the 20 in the first, I'm not giving them the 20 in the second, or vice versa. What percentage potentially could we? I guess what it is, or is the trade-off of the clarity of the question three 
versus the simplicity of question one. That's the, I think, the conversation that you and I've had several times, and I think that's at least worthy of consideration. I, I do think that there is risk there of, of people just being confused, like I've said. Um, I don't know that I'm, I'm not an election analyst, so I can't give you a percentage that I think are going to you know, mess up their ballot. But I do think that um, a more simple approach is less confusing, so it's more likely that people are able to express their actual intent. Um, but I think that if, if it's critical to people that, the, that, you, that people are able to express their intent on this perpetuity issue, we could work on the language some too and try to get something that people feel more comfortable with. I mean, we could certainly bring that back to the board, um, revise the language slightly, but we're not going to get it as simple as you want, I promise, because of the way we're bound by statute. And con conversely, Dr. Cook, I think we're going to lose people off the bat if it's in perpetuity. You know, that's taxation without representation. I mean, it's a it's a core value for a lot of our community members. And I think based on our survey results, we're going to lose 40, you know, 40 percent of whatever that population that filled out this survey and said, I don't support that. And I would hate to lose them. They said that I will support a levy increase, but I won't support the perpetuity piece. So if we've got yes votes out there for a levy, I want to get those. I think that was just 40 percent of one subsection, right? I mean, it was still 60 something percent overall. Or, or, uh, yeah. It was the community. Mm -hmm. Right. And you always have the option, obviously, of following a failed levy in perpetuity in May with a two-year levy. So, I mean, that's another option that if people express their intent that, no, we don't support it in perpetuity, you could bring it back. Okay, so Mr. Hearn made a motion, which was to um, run the maintenance operation levy at $20 million indefinitely. Uh, I was looking for a clarifying question, whether that was in one question or two questions, and then just making sure that that would um, only be in the event that a r agreement was reached with the urban renewal district. Yes, sir. Okay, one question or two for your motion there, Mr. Hearn. Um, well, I originally had one question, but if the board's more happy with two, then I'll go with that direction. <laughs> but at this point, I don't see <laughs> people jumping up and trying to second my motion <laughs> at, well, at one question so uh, I just want to make sure we have the motion right so we can um, we know what your motion is because I think right, there might be some confusion that's one the question motion and then just having one question on the ballot that was my that was my motion okay. but uh, but I'm however we get there I'm fine but then you know, if we have to break it I'm break it up to two different questions question. that's and that's where we have to go I'm fine Can, can we? Can I ask you about my sample here that I created? Sure. Can you come get it? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what I did is I just said I just struck in the language for indefinite number, and then I put it below, and I gave them like options. You can't do not that possible. For one no. question. So then, how do we feel about running another levy if we lose? Because I. I mean, I think that's the risk you run, right, on any of these, regardless of the amount is, you know, ultimately it's up to the voter, right? And if the voter doesn't approve, the voter doesn't approve, and then you need to determine why the voter doesn't approve and determine what your next step is. Um, is there a risk by, with raising it to... To change that absolutely with perpetuity is there absolutely so you know, it's but I, I'm arguing that we have considerable support historic support in the, out in the community 80% of the people was the last time voted in favor of our levy I know we weren't asking in perpetuity but that was a high percentage of people I think we have yes there's always going to be the no group there's always going I've seen it ever since I've lived in this community most of my adult life if it's always going to be people to vote I don't care what you said, I can set it at a million, and they said no. We don't. Uh, some of those arguments were, well, what, gee, you shouldn't put it on the local property taxpayer. I agree, but we already made that argument. So I, I'm, I think there's community support for that, and now um, we'll see. But that's what I, th I think. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor. Sorry, 
No, Mr. I understand. Hearn, I understand. I've been talking through. too much. Um, is there a second on Mr. Hearn's motion? Okay. I'm, s I'm seeing none. It dies for lack of a second. Is there... Um, If it were the same motion except asking it in two questions, is there support for that? I guess I'm not making that motion because I can't, but, um, or are we looking at more time here? Or the wording would be, give me an example of the wording. Motion, just said, let the amount. At $20 million. A second, a second question being the set in perpetuity. I'll make that motion then. So that'd be option C? I guess so. I'm also fine taking some time to hear what you know Danielle can come up with. For, I don't want to jeopardize you know not getting majority on either one, and I don't, I don't feel comfortable that I understand what the likelihood is if we get 20 on one and 30 on the other answer. So I really need the ballot language to be clear. So I would support that motion, but if it turns out that there's not a way we can provide a ballot that's clear to the community, I would be willing to to rethink it. Okay, Ms. Town, I'm going to ask for you, or ask some advice, I guess, on uh, with you. So we have a couple hiccups, I think, out there. One is this agreement with the URD, and one is uh, just the agreement around the ballot language. I think it sounds like there's, a, there's at least majority support for a $20 million figure here. The question is, how would we ask, and are we asking in perpetuity? Could we... I guess what I would like to do as chair is see us have some sort of agreement, even if it's not a, a motion, but kind of a let's agree in principle pending these couple of things. So administration has a clear direction of where we're heading, assuming th these things are reached. So can, how do we do that? So that, I mean, it's not a motion, it's more a, a, a we agree in principle on this or, or is it a motion pending agreement with the URD and final ballot, you know, approval of final ballot language. If you're looking to me, what, what I'm hearing is you're not ready. You're not quite there yet to, to uh, put that motion in place, even with conditions. Um, that would be my, I would rather come back with a strong motion of the, and a clear direction so that we can get this language and the resolution over to the county clerk um, sooner than later. That's, that's my opinion. And I'll withdraw my motion and, and with the idea, understanding of the rest of the board that I'm gonna bring up something similar in the January meeting. Based on the information we're trying to gather here, both in terms of wording and in terms of uh, Ms. Ms. Brumley's question about what it would be to increase, what, what are the, we're looking at increasing it. And I can provide some revised language, and give some consideration to that and work with Dr. Cook between now and then um, to come up with something that may be a little bit more clear. And it sounds like maybe just reversing the questions might make you all a little more comfortable. Um, so I can propose something else. And if we need to, we can bring two resolutions in January with the two different approaches even um, so we're prepared for you guys to go either direction when you're here to discuss the language as a whole board and could you also let us know what other communities that have gone for levies and perpetuity how their ballot looked if they I can certainly ask yeah. the couple of communities that I'm aware of um, I don't I would bet that they did it all as one ballot okay so we're eliminating option B, is that correct? So we're, we're really looking at A or C as far as these two ballot languages. I'm just trying to make sure we're clear and that we can simplify this as much as possible. Okay, a dollar amount, are we a heavy lean towards 20 million? Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. All right, Dr. Cook, does that uh, clarify things enough for you that you know what the expectation is for next month? I want to make sure I'm on the right page here. So we're we're looking at 20 million with perpetuity, with the idea of contingent upon an agreement with the URD, um, and ballot language currently potentially A and C, with C potentially being modified 
and those are the only two choices. Is that correct? I think so. And I'm bringing back five things. Actually, assessments were done back in the summer. Huh? So maybe we uh, can we just see if there's updated numbers from see the what county. Because I remember like. before when he was here, he talked. He may be able to talk to the county and get an idea what the growth rate was going to be for this year. But I'm just wondering if we actually have that information. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice, nothing. Okay. What I'd like to do is just take a quick break if we can. That was a long conversation there. Um, so why don't we take uh, five or six minutes and then we'll reconvene uh, just after eight o'clock.
All right. Can we go ahead and reconvene? All right. And we've got about a half page left here, so why don't we get cranking and see what we can do here? So next up, where's Dr. Nelson? He stepped outside. He's fine. Okay. Uh, is he item D or is that you? It's me. Okay. Well, then never mind. So item... Item D is uh, the geometry updated course pacing guides that were presented last month. So we set these out for uh, public review or public comment. We got none. This, if you recall, we presented these to you last month. Uh, these are the, the uh, pacing guides for uh, the geometry class um, that we worked with, uh, and I forget, the Idaho Center of, Ed of Math in Pocatello. Uh, and so uh, we're presenting those these to you for your recommendation for approval at this point we got no comments in the 30 days that they were out and available okay so this uh, was a, an item here in the agenda item D their motion would be to approve the geometry course pacing guides as presented second okay any further discussion questions okay all in favor aye any opposed Okay, motion carries, Ms. Town. Next up, uh, item E, our course pacing guides with the, on a whole bunch of courses there. And I believe there were two comments, I think on, or my, I'm sorry, no comments oh. here. That's on uh, policy. Okay. It's our recommendation to approve each of these pacing guides as well. We had these out for the entire month and received zero comments on any of these. Okay. Can I ask a clarifying question on this? And I don't know if it'd be of Dr. Cook or Dr. Nelson here, but on the K-5 discovery, um, is that similar to our high schools when we approve a program at one school, it's available at all? Would that be the same? And the answer to that is yes. Okay, yes, yeah. sorry. I see his head shaking. You're right, no one else does. Um, and is it, can that take the place of any elective course? It could be added as an additional, I know at Nexiv, they're, it's replacing music, right? But, or in lieu of music. I'm just wondering how this could go district-wide. What, what the ripple could be, Chairman yeah. Marshall? A absolutely, if the board chooses to approve this new course proposal, it would be available at any of our elementary schools. Uh, statute, only requires exposure to art, music, and PE, even though we do have standards for it. And our district has a long uh, tradition of expectations in those areas. But absolutely, uh, that could be used as a filler, an adapter of those courses in those different areas. So far, Northwest Expedition, because of their unique nature, is the only uh, uh, school that has expressed any interest in that course at this point. I understand that. I guess my question or concern would be, or what I'd hate to see is that music or art or one or the other, uh, you'll be eliminated and all of a sudden have that ripple across the district. Um, or that's one concern. I, st I still have concerns on this course just because it's we're kind of developing it as it goes and I'm not sure we've still f figured that out. Could we if the board so cho chose, kind of restrict this course to only one school or only NEXA for the time being? And <coughs> if the board's uh, purview would be <coughs> to add that caveat in, I could see no reason why that would be a concern. As far as I know, that's my concern. But um, I think on, on this course, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but th that's only my that's my concern with that course is I just would hate to see music go away from our elementary school, and that's my concern. Well, I think we'd have to probably split them up. So, is there a motion to pr to approve all courses as presented, with the exception of K five discovery? So the motion was to approve all courses as submitted 
with the exception of K5 Discovery. K5 Discovery will do on a separate motion. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye, any opposed? Okay, so K5 Discovery, excuse me, we haven't approved there. I would request, even though I can't make a motion, that uh, at least for the time being, K5 Discovery be restricted to NEXA only. And my concern there is just I, I don't want to see music get pushed out of all of our elementary schools. I know it's difficult, of course, at times to, to implement, especially with instruments and finding teachers and all those sorts of things. So I, it's one of the things that makes our district unique, one of many things. Do you want to clarify, like, for a year or two, like, what's your, yeah. what were you hoping for? Um, I mean, I would just say come back to the board, right, if we were going to, well, or if we want to open it up to anybody or if an, another school wanted to, I don't, I don't know if there's a simple way to do that. Um, so I, I'd like to have Dr. Orozco address this. I think there's an opportunity here for her to, can you come up to the mic? One of the things I would add is it, there are situations in which you have such specific programming at, our, at schools that it makes sense to do this, but I do think that uh, NEXA has a, a significant need in this request, and she's uh, requesting an opportunity to address you guys, so I'd like to give her that. Yeah, it's certainly nothing profound. It's just that I, I recognize the concern about music and its importance in our schools, and I want to publicly acknowledge that. And also, I want to offer some reassurance. I think that our Music teachers now are collaborating more strongly than they ever have. Um, there's a lot of work going on. Um, Spencer Normington is doing a lot of work with his colleagues in getting big grants for instruments and um, keyboards, you name it. They're doing a lot of work, and I'm encouraged by the enthusiasm that's been generated around um, their collaboration together and how they're uh, creating more energized music programs in school. So. I, 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 it's sort of my reassurance that I don't think that's the case. Also, I'd add, add that even at Nexa, where they've um, built the discovery, you know, um, Mr. Rutherford's a pretty strong musician himself, and they've done quite a bit of work to have a select choir. I mean, that was their goal, and to have music still be a, a, a uh, an important part of their learning is all. But I can certainly understand the, the desire to sort of specify a particular place. And like you said, Dr. Cook, it is a, it's a pretty specific school with very interesting programming, and I think they're making it work. Okay, so does someone want to make a motion on K-5 Discovery? I move to approve K-5 Discovery, but only at NEXA. Does that sound like what you're... Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you. All right. Policy for action. All right. Uh, these policies were out for review for 30 days, and we've brought them all back. We do have a couple of comments. Sorry, my computer. A couple of comments that we added uh, to your packets. Um, essentially, uh, you can see those, but we would recommend uh, approval on each of these. And if you want to uh, talk about individual policies, now would be our opportunity to go, go through each one particular, or uh, I think Nicole is here <laughs> again uh, to talk through those questions. If you recall, we presented these fairly late uh, at our last board meeting. So. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd love to answer those for you. I do like the fact that you added the, the concern about controversial issues, a statement about that you added in blue on page or whatever number it is here, uh, that understand that removing my student from this controversial topic may impact my student's ability to meet approved state and local learning standards and assessments. That was based on the cons feedback mm -hmm. you got. That was, that was feedback. A good feedback and a good change. <laughs> it was interesting feedback, I thought. I, I guess I 
differ on opinion on that because I, I thought our policy, if we have a controversial topic that, um, and I guess it depends what it is, but that um, the student doesn't miss out on those standards or the, that curriculum, you, you give them an alternative alternative assignment. I, I, I guess I see this more in a book or, um, you know, if a parent objected to a book or something, the student would just read a different book than perhaps the class would. Um, this, I guess, is a science teacher, so they're saying um, it's probably global warming and those sorts of things, I guess. Yeah. I, it, the issue is writing a policy that, that, in essence, captures every potential issue is going to be a challenge but I think this is I think it's well written the way it is right now and it's just an informational statement <coughs> that we added so I didn't say it will this is a may right yeah may affect it. Uh, and the, you're right that people are given alternatives alternatives to still meet their requirement is there a way that that could be misconstrued where it's it impacts their grade by a teacher I guess it, it may impact the students ability to meet approved state and local learning standards and assessments um, so if it's a local assessment so it's a teacher that well this is my assessment in this course and um, say they objected to whatever let's say it's global warming they objected to that and there's questions on that in the test and the student now misses those questions because they didn't participate in that lesson uh, are we getting sideways there a little bit I guess sorry Casey um, my question is is that an accurate statement I mean knowing that parents can have their children opt out for religious or moral values can you actually say if they opt out that they would not meet state approved or local learning standards and assessments? Because I don't, I don't think we can do that. I tend to agree with. Does it may not meet? Didn't thing. say it would. No, but I, I don't know that it even may not. I don't even know that you can do that. But I think with science, right? This was a science teacher that brought that, right? So you, you have their state standards now, right? They were controversial. It took them two or three years to pass them. And um, I'm sure that's what this is dealing with, right? Or that, that's what this is anticipating. So I, that's my concern is yeah, this is different because we're talking about a, a standard that's tied to a specific learning objective versus where we've seen this in the past. It's been more around a book or a subject matter. or it's founded in controversial topics, right? And this idea is that you, you may see assessments in which controversial topics will be addressed. And I think we're trying to, trying to govern to the masses here and not try to get specific on either end of this, but you could go either direction uh, and potentially be out of compliance on this. So I think this, I don't think that the sentence, I think the sentence is informational and I think that it does remind parents and kids that, hey, there's, there's some, there could be some extra, you could have a science assessment from the state in which some of these questions might be a part of that. And your exclusion from uh, this activity or this learning opportunity could be impacted on that. I, that's, that's really the intent of what we're trying to talk about. Uh, we're not, you could run this to, the, to both links and come up with, you know, in theory, uh, if I, declare that you know evolution is is controversial and uh, we teach an entire unit six weeks in on evolution and a student could argue or a parent could argue that my kid needs to be excluded from that because for us it's a controversial topic well that's going to be significant aspects of the curriculum I think that's the intent is to, to handle and just remind them that you understand that that's the case. So, and Chair Morris or Superintendent Cook and members of the board, I might be able to provide a little bit of clarity on this because our opt-out policy, although it's not so named, does not just exclude a student from content. It provides for a substitution. 
Uh, so if a particular title or a novel or a particular topic was out of there, they work with the classroom teacher through a form to try to find something equitable so that the standards are still being covered, that the topic is being covered in a general way. Uh, it, it's not just excluding that content completely out of that. We do work collaboratively to try to find that in middle ground. Is the wording on that of local learning necessary? Uh, so currently it says, as a parent guardian, I understand that removing my student from this controversial topic may impact our student's ability to meet approved state and local learning standards and assessments. Could, if it... Take out local? Yeah, I'm just, I, I understand what the intent is, but yeah. could it be, you know, I think the first time this impacts a student's grade in the class, you're, you're gonna have some problems. Um, I think, and I, I know that's not the intention, but could it, you know, you got to look at these policies. Yeah, how can we? Uh, so the slide feel more comfortable if it didn't say local learning. If it just said meet approved state standards and assessments. Yes. I, I think we're supportive of that. Our curriculum is based upon state standards and uh, based upon the, the Common Core, right? And so I don't think that we'd be opposed to that. Okay. So. I'll make a motion to approve it with that change. Yeah, so let's get a little more specific for Ms. Towner. So that would be the motion to approve policy 2340F1 as revised by stri striking and local learning. Okay, motion was made, I think. Did you make the motion? Yeah, I did. Okay, and it was seconded by Ms. Pickford. Any further discussion on that? Hey, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So is that everybody? Okay. Uh, and then is there a motion to approve the, oh, I'm sorry, we have another comment here that we need to get to, sorry. Let's get to that. So there was another comment on the open enrollment policy. On your mic, please. And I don't know who this question goes to, Dr. Cook? Um, so it says if the student moves out of their school, their attendance zone school during the year, then they have to initiate open enrollment request to stay in their school. That just seems difficult, you know, if they're in their fourth grade year and they have all their friends. So would that mean in their fifth grade year they potentially would have to move schools? It could happen. Sure, yeah. they moved. Yeah. That's what the comment's well, we getting at, and I kind of agree with the comment. I think it, that's pretty... I, I, I would capture before we we jump to that. We do everything we can to keep kids in their schools, but but in practice, you know, without a policy like this, you are essentially mm -hmm. yeah. creating a situation which moment. which certain schools will be in trouble uh, with just numer numbers of kids. So we have um, <clears throat> so so of course if kids leave our school district um, they stay mostly as a courtesy and a generosity of the district they stay through the end of that year if, if they move out of district um, but you're asking if a child um, moves across town if the family moves across town the uh, um, out of procedure the elementary administrators especially have worked hard to honor um, consistency and coherence for children so keeping families together has been really important and keeping kids in the communities especially children that we call sort of fragile children keeping them with their peers and their community so they apply for open enrollment that's true so because they've just left that school zone but um, the practice is to keep to keep our little ones in the places where they're known and and loved and feel a sense of connection. Would you say, generally speaking, with our open <coughs> enrollment policy, like uh, Dalton, for instance, has a lot of students that apply through open enrollment that don't live in Dalton. So do they reapply every year in hopes that the same space will be available? Is that how that generally? 
Um, n not actually. I mean, they're, they're, they, they fill out a form explaining their intentions in the early spring, that they'd like to stay in the school where they are, and we try to honor that. Yeah. Um, Dr. Cook alluded to the fact, and we all know it, right? Our schools are, are I think, busting at the seams, you know? But so um, we've tried to do that, and it, it's um, people, people have been pretty careful about not saying necessarily once in, always in, yeah, that's but that's in, a, in effect, that is what we're trying to do. Not so much because you've earned the right to be there, but because we know that it's good for kids to stay in those communities where their friends and their teachers and their the rest of their siblings are, that it's a good thing. I think if I read the comment, is the, the concerns because the word or revoked, right, is added. So their concerns whether a student could be unenrolled because the school all, all of a sudden became overcrowded. So do we want to handle these policies all together, the one, two, three, four, five remaining policies? Okay. So is there a motion to approve the remaining policies as presented? So moved. Okay. All right. Uh, Lisa made the motion and I'm s Jennifer. Okay. I think, we, I think we should debate each one of them for <laughs> We'll let you do that later. Okay. All in favor? All in favor. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We are into information items now. Nicole, thanks for coming again. She's got one. <laughs> oh, she's got one coming. <coughs> okay. okay. Information items uh, G is a math one update. Good evening, Dr. Yeah. Cottle. Good evening, Chair Morris Rowe, Superintendent Cook, and board members. It's our favorite topic, which is math. And we love math. We do. We do. We love math. So in your packet, you'll see our update. What I've done is up updated the implementation plan. In November, our Math 1 teachers met and collaborated around the Unit 3 checkpoint assessment. They will be collaborating on Monday around the next common unit plan. Um, we also met with high school principals and talked about how we can better support our Math 1 teachers. So in here you will find some perception data from a survey it's that, that's based on a rubric. And the rubric is Teaching for Robust Understanding. And it's basically a rubric that was established out of the algebra teaching study from UC Berkeley and Michigan State. And really what the rubric fo focuses on in a perfect world, what would best practice instruction look like in the classroom? And the content could be any content, but it was specifically adapted for mathematics and then expanded. So this was our baseline data, and it was basically to see how our teachers felt. In a perfect world, all these things would be happening in the classroom as far as cognitive demand, rigor, if students have access to um, best practices, if they have agency and voice, and how formative assessment is used. So in the survey, there was a scale of one to six. One is that these things never happen in my classroom. Six was that they always happen. And so teachers kind of gave feedback on where they felt. Then as administrative team, we used a little data protocol similar to what the teachers use to look at how we can better support our teachers. And so where we're using this is our Math 1 implementation plan is not just about the curriculum, it's also about providing professional development and changing our teaching practices. So this is just really baseline data on how our teachers are feeling and then we will revisit this later on in the year after we, after we go through and provide some staff development and visit with teachers and see what we can do to help. So I think that's why a lot of times you'll see some middle of the road because some of it is happening, but not all the time. And what we want to do is eventually get it towards happening more often. So I'll take any questions that you may have. Okay, questions for Dr. Cottle? Question now, it looks like. Yeah, all right. Yeah, okay, thank, well, thank you. you. 
Okay, next up, H, Ad Hoc Literature Committee. This is adding a member, right? This is, uh, uh, we have a novel uh, that we'd ask for your approval on. Okay. Mike? Chair Morris Rowe, Superintendent Cook, and members of the board, two months ago you approved a brand new course for the district, <laughs> Young Adult Literature. Well, uh, that course included a novel in its course pacing guide that is not currently adopted or approved for whole group instruction. That's the title, Speak by Anderson. Uh, this was presented to your ad hoc literature committee this last month, and they uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, they felt that it was an accurate representation of uh, life in a typical high school, uh, that they thought that it would be very relevant for students in this course. There were certainly some areas that they thought our students may need some supports in uh, understanding, and uh, certainly the, uh, the uh, personal issues that students may experience uh, may also uh, be touchy for some. Uh, but overall, it was passed and presented to you tonight for whole group instruction as recommended 8-0. Excuse me, 701. The committee was there 8-0. There was one abstention who did not complete the title. Okay, and so this is just information for us tonight. It'll be out for review for the next 30 days and come back next month. Even though you haven't been to a library, we will have a library at our <laughs> district office where we could provide you a personal copy. Thank you. We have a children's edition of that. <laughs> is there pictures? Pictures and big words. Okay, next up is item I, uh, French 3 text. In addition, Chair Morris Road, Superintendent Cook, we took a look uh, at all of our texts in world languages is if we stay on our six-year adoption cycle, we'd be up in two more years. But one of the things we felt in our data reviews of AP scores is that there was really a lapse in French 3, that the content of the text as supporting instruction was not as great as it could have been. Uh, so uh, Madame Carr at Coeur d'Alene High School has proposed to you tonight a replacement text called Bien D. Uh, BND uh, has been reviewed with our textbook adoption tool. You see that in your, uh, in your packet. And overall, she's pretty much in love with the text and does believe that it will provide relevance and rigor uh, to help support instructions to get them to the highest level of using French in conversation. Okay, any questions for Dr. Nelson on this? And again, this will be out for 30 days review. We'll get you a copy. I have a question. Go for it. Does anybody else, other than just putting this out for review, is there are there any other French teachers that would weigh in or would we look at? So she's from CHS. Would High you School. have Lake City? Located? We did. Uh, Mr. Maurer is the French teacher at Lake City High School. He did have the opportunity to uh, provide input to Mrs. Carr's uh, recommendation. His email back to me was about as simply put, "I'll do whatever she does." <laughs> Uh, Dr. Nelson, I have a question. So when we adopt, or if this is approved, then the scope of sequence will come, just thinking about math, soon how after. confusing that was, soon after. So you'll get this, review it, love it, and then develop scope of sequence. And for the most part, I think it does dovetail well when you look at how it aligns to the district curriculum. I believe it's on page five. You'll see that there's actually a lot of alignment already. Uh, which I think is one of the reasons that she did enjoy this. It really is bringing a more modern title that, uh, that brings more context and relevance to use of the language. How many students do we have that take French 3? Um, I can look into that uh, the last time that I probably say somewhere between 60 to 80 district wide. Oh. Okay. Dr. Nelson, do we, I'm trying to think, it may have been one of the language previously where we had a textbook reviewed by someone from U of I or uh, NIC, like the Japanese maybe, or one we of those will, courses. And we will actually put together an ad hoc review uh, as well for this along the way. This is the first step of that process. Uh, but we will have to go through some sort of an ad hoc review uh, as part of this process. This is just simply providing that for you now. We'll put that together with a native speaker, most likely in the university setting. Okay, so this is not coming back next month for action then? We're, we're hoping oh. to get it down at the same time that uh, open community preview is. Okay. So, the, so there will be an the next 30 days. ad hoc recommendation <coughs> at the next meeting along when this Trying comes back. Trying to put back. together a small committee right now. Okay. All right, thank you. My pleasure. 
Okay, any other questions for Dr. Nelson there? Okay. Item J is policies for information, and there are a number here. Um, Nicole, are one of these yours? Or are you just here to answer? No. Yeah. yeah. So, no, we have, there's kind of two situations here. The first one is our uh, recommended policy uh, based upon ISBA, so 3530. Uh, suicide prevention is uh, based upon uh, some feedback we got early on. We took ISBA's recommendation. They did a generalized policy, and we kind of tweaked it locally. And then the other, what, six of them are all policies as recommended by the ISBA fall update. And so I think if there's questions on the first one, if you want to talk about 3530, I'd like to, Nicole is here again very patiently uh, to answer any questions. This was a... This has been a significant conversation in the district for quite some time now, so um, please do not hesitate to ask questions if you have any. Um, the first sentence where it just says, teachers or school districts with knowledge of direct evidence of a student's suicidal tendencies have a duty to warn. To me, it's not, it felt incomplete. Um, to warn of what and how does a district do that and so I had sent, I don't know if you got that to her, but I had sent a question yesterday about that and just suggested some things. And is there, is there a reason we have to keep it that way? Or is there any thoughts on the comment that I had made? Um, Chairman Maurice Rowe and fellow board members, we also felt that way in the group. Um, and with the original policy, it was stated in such a way that it didn't seem to the group um, as a student advocacy statement, it seemed much more of a cover our backside statement. That language does come from the Idaho Code. Um, so while we changed it to be more student focused and student advocacy related, we did keep that uh, original language of duty to warn. But we had those same questions in particular, what is direct evidence um, and the definition of that. So we did go back to the code and read through it. Um, I have read your uh, question about, I think there was um, some wording in there about inform and... Yeah, a duty to, as opposed to warn, like I was wondering, is it, I don't, I don't have my question in front of me, but <laughs> I, I, I was saying um, something I, like that. I think we would um, definitely entertain that idea in that um, we had very similar questions and if we could provide a simpler way to state what the next action is yeah. um, that would be great in addition to that I think there was a comment about um, what would be providing a purpose essentially in the policy in that the procedure that follows tells you what the process is and how to do this um, so I liked yeah, your statements on initially um, and we I can bring them back to the group one of the things that I think it, it prompted us to consider and discuss we're currently you know, we were working on the mandatory reporting policy and we had the entire procedure, we redid the whole entire thing and then um, we got some very interesting and, and really good feedback, I might add, about from counselors about are we potentially creating a record um, through, uh, through actions by policy when we talk about manda mandatory reporting. And so one of the other questions that, that this, this promotes is, uh, when you talk about what's the school district's responsibility, you want to uh, you want to deliver support and make it student centered on how when we get in a situation where we potentially believe that a, a student is suicidal, how you're going to address that, but then how do you follow through on this policy in in which to ensure that you're following through that we might be creating a procedure that then creates a, a document that then could be a record of something that we don't necessarily want to be the holders of records of. And so this is, so I can tell you, we're walking a little bit of a line here, uh, trying to find what's the right way to support our kids without creating uh, uh, FERPA and HIPAA violations, arguably, right? I mean, uh, for a lack of better way to approach this. So I, I don't know, we don't have the answer yet, but as you are aware, we haven't brought the mandatory reporting changes to you yet because we're still trying to flesh those out ourselves. So just as an FYI, I see this as being similar in light um, where we want to meet the needs and expectations to help students, but you don't want to create a, a record for all practical matters that we've done that so that then in, in theory, it would be then core request, I mean, uh, open record requestable. 
it seems like that's what the that person is missing is who you're going to warn, who is the who you're reporting to. So I get why it's complicated, but. And I would like to address that. I think it's important to um, remember that when we're working with students, what that warning looks like and who is warned depends upon the student's presentation. So if we have imminent danger, there's a plan, there's an access to means, um, and this is going to happen as far as the student is concerned, that's more likely to be a 911 call um, or a direct involvement with the SRO versus a student who has perhaps exhibited warning signs, someone has asked a QPR question, we're going to hope that the student makes it down to the nurse's office um, or the counselor's office, but in the procedure allowing for there to be admin as part of that team as well in a school psych if they self-select, we would have multiple people in the building who could address the student's needs. Could, that time. could you make as basic as more appropriate resources, or is that too vague? Do they want the, the issue you run into is then what do you do if someone doesn't? I think it would be important to note too that school nurses are making records and documenting when students receive referrals and when we receive follow up information. I, I think it might be that we're discussing not creating a roster of who has received these services. Um, so individual student records are kept, but we're not compiling data on groups of students who have received these services. This is a work in progress. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, I'll, I'll maybe clarify. So it's for information for us. So right. uh, typically it means it's out for 30 days for comment. Those could be public comment, uh, staff comment, or our comments. Okay. Um, so it would come back to us next month. Um, what I was going to suggest is is it sound like you had some ideas that um, Nicole uh, agrees we could clarify that so maybe over the next 30 days we can work to clarify that and bring it back with some modification next month and if there's serious modifications we can put it out for 30 days again um, if they're kind of minor wording type stuff we don't have to, to put them back out okay thank you very much um, are, are you looking at it's like a, I, as a therapist I had a duty to warn and that was warn oftentimes if it's serious enough I'd call the police or I'd call the hospital is that what you're talking about such as school district personnel and they have a duty to maybe inform or take action about student suicidal tendencies. Then it should state how to do that as, enumer as enumerated below. So that's what that was the whole comment and suggestion that I'd made that I think she's gonna work with. I think Tom maybe brings up a, um, a good point here. I kind of also struggled with the conversation in that um, as a nurse, I have a duty to warn. And so this is a very comfortable language for me in a professional standard. Um, and I think school counselors probably also have that professional standard. What we have in the district now is these, these professional standards being followed, but we don't have a procedure that we're following. So that might be some of the confusion too, and that we're already doing these activities, but they haven't been labeled as such in a procedure. Okay, any other questions for Dr. Cook on the other two, four, six policies and associated procedures that were presented. Okay, so the, oh. While Tamara's looking, I had that my comment on 7270 about the last sentence that had the two, word, two words real in it. Was I missing something? Was that supposed to say it that way? If you go to policy 7270, which is like the last one, very close. It's on page, it's on page 19 of the iPad one, of that document. That's the iPad one. That's <laughs> funny. And it's on 7270, page three, the very bottom. It said, in the event that the district no longer needs real or personal or real property. And I was like, I don't know that there is such a thing as just real, the real property, and there's personal property. I don't know about real. <laughs> what if it's real personal? 
<laughs> Flake. That could be. <laughs> Okay, we got these for my SBA, so I think it's just a typo too. Tamber, did you find yours? Okay. All right. If there's no other questions, we're done with those. Uh, board report information here looks like uh, Lynn just has. Calendar, oh, okay. She inquired if there would be an opportunity for a second board meeting in the month of December to try to come to an agreement um, on the levy amount. And not wait till January. She just asked if it was possible. I mean, I th we don't have a workshop scheduled this month, is that correct? We set aside the third Monday, like we always do, and have those topics for this month. The, um, if I recall from our conversation, um, the URD's meeting is, in, is not until the 19th, is that correct? That's correct, <coughs> yeah, the 19th. So the uh, Ignite doesn't meet until the 19th. So if part of our uh, issue was the, the ongoing request would be that we have that result. We'd have to do it after that. I understood Danielle's request is more about the amount, not so much in on the permanency part, right? There didn't seem to be an issue with meeting prior to the URD meeting. Um, I think it was just more the issue of, yes, you're right, the ballot question and or questions and the dollar amount. Could we do like Thursday the 20th. I know that's getting late in the week right before an extended break, but. Or that Wednesday the 19th, if we did it in the evening, I don't, I assume, I don't really know, but do they meet during the day, at night? Uh, I mean, to me, oh, that's not. They important. meet at four. I'm sorry. They meet at four, okay. Yeah, but if they meet at 4 o'clock on the 19th. I mean, we... The... So on the 19th, I think if if we want the Ignite to be able to resolve this, and assuming they're going to at their night meeting on the 19th, I think it'd have to be later on the 19th, right? Six o'clock or something? Well, so we have meet at four? You'd have to, it depends on what you want. You could either do, do it earlier and make a conditional vote, depending on approval of Ignite, uh, their board, or we could do it after their meeting and there wouldn't be a conditional. I, I can tell you this, we'd, appreciate an early the earlier decision the, the earliest decision we can get would give us more time to start working on on an informational and educational materials so say it's on the 17th if we just stick with our normal monday um you're, you're saying we could have a motion so assuming it, we reach agreement with urd and we're going to have it drafted by then anyways right we're just waiting board approval it would be this you know whatever option and if we didn't have agreement it'd be something different potentially right I, uh, for right. me if, if we don't have the agreement i don't support perpetuity i mean right right and so what we would do uh in theory let's say it was 
let's play it out. Let's say that the amount and uh, conditional approval on perpetuity was done on like the 17th. We would then go to the meeting, present this to the board, to the uh, Ignite board on the 19th. If they approve the agreement, then that gives us what we would need. If, uh, or if they didn't approve it, then we would come back and we can make adjustments because I think the, 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 the board is clear, at least in, in preliminary discussions, that without this agreement, this perpetuity should not be. Uh, either way, we would have that information. So at the very latest, we're hitting the deadline of January 22nd ballot language. And uh, every day we can get to work on that stuff, I can promise you staff would appreciate. Potentially, yeah. I think we should figure five o'clock on the 17th. Yeah, I, I may not make that meeting, but that's um, kind of an every step. <coughs> Will you so it's not that long. I can, you know, I leave in the morning every day, unless we have a big blizzard or something. Well, if you're not in the event, you're not. We're going to want to phone you in. Yeah. Assuming you can phone in for that. If we're talking about voting on the maintenance and operation levy, I think you need to be a part of that vote. And Steve, can you have my questions answered by then? Okay. Yeah, I think so. I, having some pretty clear guidelines helps specific answering questions specifically it, get, it just gets tough because it's hard to know all the different possibilities and options so have him still you know he had a, a, some really good models have him share some of our model, his models with us not at that meeting but just in the future what specific to what Models for we can, we can growth? No, for capital construction, how it would affect the o overall um, residual values and what, what numbers. So taxing capacity models, gotcha, okay. Okay, so I think we got our schedule stuff figured out there. Uh, we'll plan on that meeting on the 17th. Just a reminder here, uh, January meeting, January 7th, that's our new annual meeting date that we used to do in July. So we're going to have some procedural things to handle on July 7th, chair, vice chair, oath office, or not oath office, but uh, code of conduct, or what is that uh, that we do? Right. Treasurer, clerk, all those sorts of things. So if there's nothing else, meeting adjourned. <laughs>